Well, I uh, I took the liberty of uh, since I do work for United Airlines uh, and I didn't have a good uh, FPOS slide, I, I put in uh, a nice picture of the mountains and, and the airplane that I fly. And uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll let my bias out on the table right from the very beginning. Um, anyway, uh, with that, I'm going to go to the next slide where I'm going to talk a little bit about some of mainly I'm going to put up thoughts and ideas, and I don't know that we're going to uh, have uh, yeah, I, I would like my thoughts and ideas to be challenged, so we'll see how much interaction we get there. Um, after me, I think we've got uh, Mark Fana from Alpa, who I think Roger Sultan, are you sitting in for Mark today? Yeah, um, Mark is on two meetings, so he's going to try to listen in, but uh, I'll, I'm, I guess I'm sitting in. I don't I don't have a presentation set, but I've got lots of notes. Okay, see. excellent. And and for those that don't know Roger, Roger is formerly of the uh, FAA Flight Standards, and actually, I think you you are the primary author of uh, Advisory Circular 0063 and another one, which I forget the number of, which yeah, uh, that, which provides <laughs> a lot of yes. provide a lot of the weather guidance that is actually the current guidance that is published by the FAA. So. Uh, even if Roger is a fill-in, he's a quite able fill-in, and uh, we'll we'll see what what the ideas are there. Uh, Debbie Kowalewski from the uh, uh, dispatcher with United Airlines, but also she's she's here today representing the Airline Dispatch Federation, the uh, the professional uh, uh, organization that uh, deals with the uh, dispatch. Um, Debbie, I'm, I don't think that you have a presentation either. I'm not sure, but uh, we'll ask for from you and we'll see if we can get some you involved in some dialogue also. Thank you. Yes, uh, no uh, presentation, Rocky, but I'm here with uh, notes and comments. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate that. Um, and we're going to round out with uh, John Kosak from the NBAA and uh, John's going to present, you know, the uh, the business aircraft view of, of this subject. It's uh, it, it should be interesting because you know, us airlines, sometimes we, we arm wrestle with NBAA, but I, I have a feeling we're going to be in lockstep with NBAA on this issue. We also did have, uh, we were trying to get two other presenters. Uh, we had uh, Matt Tucker, who's a retired uh, air traffic controller from uh, Atlanta Center. Uh, he has actually has a, ha a family emergency going on right now and actually had to back out um, at kind of the last minute. Which is unfortunate because we could have gotten the ATC side of uh, of the issue, but uh, well, heck, you know, we can lo unloose all these dispatchers and pilots without any ATC and see what happens. <laughs> and so, anyway, um, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with Matt and his family during this time. And then we also did try and get uh, a representative from the. Uh, Oh, and John, John Kosak, did you have a presentation today or are you going to just take notes and make comments also? Uh, I do have a presentation, so um, it's, it's a few slides, but uh, I, I do have uh, some fun stuff to talk about. So, OK, awesome. And I do want to thank you, John. John tried to get uh, a representative from the Air Traffic Control System Command Center, their severe weather unit to, to also speak and, and present during this uh, uh, topic and unfortunately, with the, uh, the with the uh, all the work at home rules and the, that are in effect, uh, it just we couldn't make it work out. But I appreciate you trying, John. And again, that would have been good if we could have it happen. But I think that we have enough expertise on the panel itself just to uh, generate an interesting discussion and uh, and talk a little bit about what some of the possibilities are. So with that, um, that's going to be the the participants in the panel. And I'll go ahead and lead off with a, just a few slides that these slides are intended to be a little bit provocative, just so you know. <laughs> um, and again, it's they're intended to kind of spur thought and see see where we can go with with this idea. One, one thing, even before I get to my first slide, though, I'm going to comment on the title of, of this session. And I'm going to have to blame myself because I'm the one I think that might have named it. Um, but it's talk, it says, talks about emerging weather tools in the cockpit. And uh, while there are some, um, I think the the primary thing that's happening today is there is connectivity to the cockpit where there never used to be. So, you know, in the past we had VHF radios, we had voice, we had ACARS communications, which is essentially texting uh, with a very bad keyboard. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, and so the the really interesting new thing is is connectivity where we have graphics. Unfortunately, I think most of us have the equivalent of a 2400 baud modem connection to the ground for those of us that have it in there. Although sometimes it's better, it, it, it it's somewhat it can be uh, dependent. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But but I think that's really what is new is that connectivity. And I think one of the things, one of my desired outcomes from this session today is a, is um, a lot of thought to go into what are the requirements for new products based on this new connectivity that didn't used to be there. Because um, I don't think that the products are really out there that are tailored to to this communication medium and, and the the roles and that could be in place with this new capability. So with that, I'm, I'm uh, I need to get to my slides. <laughs> Cockpit participation in uh, collaborative decision making initiatives. Um, you know, so my my opening statement is kind of a challenge to the to the uh, traffic flow management world, and that is uh, can are are there systemic and indiv individual flight efficiencies that that can be enabled by um, deviating from traffic management initiatives that are that are in place um, and you know the the my my reason for saying this is generally it, it's uh, the traffic flow management world it, it, it's kind of like trying to drive a really big ship and when you try and get it to turn directions it can be really difficult and therefore uh, once you have a traffic management initiative like a playbook routing in effect sometimes they go in effect early um, usually they don't go in effect too early, but a lot of times they're in effect way beyond the time period they need to be in effect, which leads to massive inefficiencies. And so um, I, I, I view this entire capability of having the cockpit more involved in CDM as a way of making the more nimble and responsive to the changing conditions that are out there. And I think that all of the players, you know, the pilots in the air, the dispatchers on the ground, um, we all have a role to play in trying to increase that nimbleness to to make the system more efficient and get more out of it. So, so that's that's my going in uh, provocative statement. Um, you know, and then I'm, you know, currently CDM is is really ground centric. It's you know each airline has uh, um, air traffic control desks usually within their airline operations center. Um, you know, and then the uh, each each individual air route traffic control center has a uh, traffic flow management TMU that uh, interacts with the air traffic control system command center who kind of oversees CDM. And it's interesting because in the past I've seen diagrams of CDM as the, the three legged stool and they, you know, the, the cockpit um, AT or the ATC, uh, the airline operation control and the cockpit. And and I, I always say, well, the stool is going to fall over. The cockpit doesn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> so. Um, that's some of the discussion I'd like to talk about today. Um, today, most of our our participation in reroutes is just limited to tactical avoidance along the current route of flight. So we really um, we don't get much of a st strategic input, and I'll talk about that in my examples in a few minutes. Um, and yeah, you know, the big thing is with aircraft connectivity, we now have information flow to and from the cockpit of, of graphical weather or graphical products. So it's not just text messaging or or voice message voice messaging. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit to um, things that I do in industry is I co-chair RTCA Special Committee 206, which is writing a minimum aviation system performance standard for um, aeronautical information management, uh, which includes uh, weather products or it's it's aircraft information. Uh, AI plus meteorological information via data link. So we're writing really data link standards. But one of the things in our terms of reference is we have um, a charge to write a minimum information, a set of information for a cockpit to be involved in, in CDM. And so that's really, you know, my, my concern here is without ground rules, without structure, without training, um, you know, we are presenting information to pilots that they never had in the air before, and how are they going to act on it? And is will their acting on it be constructive uh, versus 
disruptive because it certainly could be either. Um, my, my contention is, is that if we write a good minimum information content set in, in a mask that that would make an aircraft that's trying to request an exception from a traffic management initiative to to make that exception predictable, reliable, and and therefore acceptable, um, you know, as long as it doesn't harm more others who are trying to do something different. So, um, so you know, my question is, well, what what kind of uh, priority could we get? And and again, this kind of goes to the airline business case because we airlines can't invest in this stuff back for it. So, you know, could we get relief from playbook routings? Could we get preferential treatment in airspace flow program? Um, you know, for for having this information set. I mean, those are the two things when I brainstorm that that I think are are probably most likely and easiest easiest to implement. However, I, I will not say they will. Nothing is easy, but uh, easier than other things. And now I'm going to go into a couple examples. And this first example I flew actually a long time ago. Um, it was a Denver to Philadelphia flight in a 737 back in 2007. And I will say. Uh, the CDM world has changed a little bit since then. Um, you know, back then when we had a, a playbook route specified, we were supposed to fly the entire playbook without deviation. Um, nowadays, they have what they call a starred segment of the uh, um, playbook routing, and and you really, there, the agreement is to you must fly the starred segment, you know, the route segment between the stars, and before or after the stars, you can, you know deviate as as you see fit from from whatever the uh, playbook routing is um, that's an improvement but it's still not enough to really make the system nimble the way i would like it to be but uh, but i did get back when i flew this flight in 2007 i was working with our dispatcher and i had uh, we actually had xm satellite radio in the cockpit for this one and uh, i was able to look at real-time convection and updates from that and you know on this playbook routing that um, added 45 minutes to the flight time, I was able to uh, cut about 25 minutes of that additional extra flight time off by. So, and this is a a, um, a screenshot from Poet. Uh, those that are familiar with that that wonderful old tool, which doesn't exist anymore. The the magenta line on top was our normal route of flight. Um, the green line on the bottom was the playbook routing for that day, which added the 45 minutes of flight time. The little orange lines are every ATC reroute um, and route. You can see I got a bunch of them, and the black line is what I actually flew, which is kind of in the middle. Uh, and um, and again, again, um, you know, we had special dispensation. This was a flight on a Saturday afternoon, so it, it really didn't have the the traffic density that you might have on a on a weekday. Um, and you know, and again, I did did work through the dispatcher to make sure that. The requests that I was making were, were acceptable to, to to him as or her as as I went along, um, but you can see there there was quite a savings possible. So let's go to the next example. This this flight I flew last summer, so this is much more recent. Um, an LA to Houston flight. It was a thunderstorm day in West Texas. You can see this is unfortunately just a snapshot, and I don't I don't have a way of animating it and showing you how the convection was moving around. Um, and I, and I believe this is an, a snapshot of near the end of the flight. So the normal flight time, flight time was three hours and 15 minutes. Um, the playbook routing added uh, quite a bit of time, yeah. almost almost 45 minutes. Um, it took us north um, almost over Dallas. And then actually the playbook routing had us going all the way into central Louisiana and then uh, arriving in uh, Houston from the northeast quarter. And, and it was really... It was that convection uh, west of San Antonio that was really driving this playbook routing. And, uh, you know, about an hour into the flight, I actually I, I flew this in a 787, which the luxury I have in the 787 is I have a satellite phone. So I phoned the dispatcher and had a, you know, much easier to do than than VHF voice. And uh, we had a conversation about as I was over central Arizona looking at it and saying, well, do you agree with me that the weather over central and west texas really isn't forming as it was forecast to and you know we should see if we can get a reroute um and the dispatcher agreed and said go for it, try it and and we actually did 
as we got into eastern Arizona, I requested the the, the regular route of flight back over San Antonio, um, and I got it from the initial controller. And then as soon as I get to the next sector, uh, I think the TMU must have got wind of what was happening, and they they immediately put us back on the playbook routing. <laughs> so, uh, so I had a minor success for a little while. And then the interesting thing about this is um, as we progress further eastward, uh, and you can see it from the snapshot here that the northeastern arrival corridor to Houston actually shut down due to convective weather. Um, and as we were crossing the uh, Louisiana border, they actually had to clear us back over towards San Antonio to do the western arrival. <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, it, it ended up being actually even adding more time than just the original playbook flight time. It was ended up being four hours and 15 minutes. And and my contention is, you know, had it been considered, you know, that that we could have made it through that line of uh, weather in, in, in central or and western Texas earlier, you know, we could have saved quite a bit and been more efficient. Um, so that's another example of a playbook routing and, and what it does to you. Um, I think I have another slide or two here. Uh oh, and now my slides are frozen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Operator. Um, so there's a couple questions, and again, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here to may maybe generate some discussion as we go into a discussion a little bit later on. Um, but again, with the RTCA work, we need what is the minimum set of weather information and traffic flow information that you need uh, to create a more predictable flight path and one that is perhaps an exception to the current traffic management initiative. Um, obviously, uh, in the both examples that I gave, they, they really centered around convective weather and you would need a flight path that's free of convective weather, but also you need a flight path that's free of saturated ATC sectors. So it's not and that's one of the points that I really wanted to make. It's it's not just weather, um, it's ATC workload that really generates this. Um, uh, and, and there really isn't a product out there. I mean, there are there is a product that the FAA uses internally to describe um, sector workload, uh, but it's not. There's a lot of shortcomings with it, and and I don't know that it would be well. In fact, I from what I understand, it would not be really the right tool to to put you know in, into uh, into the cockpit for cockpit use but nonetheless we need that information so how do we how do we get that another aspect of this is coordination required between the cockpit and the dispatch airline operations center um, you know again we have this information in the cockpit now we have graphical weather where we never used to have it um, however as i mentioned early on it's it's relatively low bandwidth, and we're looking at it on a little 10 pin, 10 inch iPad display. Whereas my dispatcher on the ground um, has, you know, three or four 21 inch displays and hopefully pretty good connectivity to whatever weather products they're they're looking at. And, you know, much it's it's going to be. They're going to get the big picture much faster than we are. So the question is, um, there needs to be some coordination. And, and it's an interesting question because when when John talks from the uh, NBAA perspective, they don't have an AOC to fall back on. So uh, what what are they going to do for coordination or confirmation of that what they're asking for is reasonable? Um, and the other the other issue with with us as far as the pilot and dispatcher relationship goes, you know, in, in the cockpit, there's two of us that, you know, we we can we're really focused on flying the airplane and that's our number one job is to make sure we do that safely but we're also we can be especially in the en route arena focused on how do we optimize this one individual flight whereas a dispatcher is probably going to be working a number of other flights and yeah you know, dispatcher workload is going to become an issue even though they have much better connectivity than we do um, and so how do we get the balance between you know which function belongs best where and, and, and in today's world, one of the interesting things is only I in the cockpit, once an airplane is airborne, can really request a reroute. And, you know, in the future world, it would be really nice to have our dispatchers have the ability to propose a reroute 
and root. But but again, that's one of the operational control issues, and that's one of the reasons why it is the way it is today. Is uh, once you're in the air, it's it's strictly between the local, the ATC controller and the cockpit as to what is the trajectory of that flight. Um, now we both have to rely on you know the the ATC controller has to get permission. Theoretically, should get permission, you know, from the TMU if if there's a a reroute beyond their sector. Um, so there's a lot of coordination involved. But again, today a lot of that is manual, and how do we automate that? How do we make the system work better? Well, one of the last one of the last points I want to make is there needs to be ground rules for how do we request a deviation from a traffic management initiative because again um, whatever we propose has to be uh, have a high probability of success because without that we will be introducing more chaos than efficiency into the system and so there has to be some really clear ground rules on on how do we ensure that our flight path is clear of convective weather and clear of congested ATC sectors. And then and my last this is my last slide. So um, you know this is kind of my warning. The, the broadband graphical weather is here. <laughs> Whether you will plan for it or not, you know, the it's in the cockpit. Uh, pilots are using it today. Um, they're using it without a lot of guidance on what to do with it. So uh, you know so we need to do something. I mean, remaining silent or not addressing this issue, I don't think is an option. I think this this issue needs to be addressed. So that's uh, that's kind of the first bullet there. Um, and and I've already stated that it, it, this this capability can either be helpful or disruptive. So how do we make sure that it's helpful as opposed to disruptive? And then my last bullet really is uh, kind of I, I would encourage those of you who are in the session today or, or listening in um, if you have any thoughts or suggestions or um, you know your participation in, in RTCA special committee 206 is welcome we we need participation we need more participation and uh, that will help us to make a better standard for you know how, how to inter introduce this to, to make efficiency versus chaos so and I think with that that is my last slide and I would like to open it up for a little bit of discussion. David, I don't know if you have any comments or um, yeah, questions. Yeah, I do have one, uh, Rocky, that uh, okay. Matthias uh, actually sent a little earlier. And I certainly have an opinion with my background, which is similar to yours. But uh, with your international flying um, and, and your uh, CDM work that you do in industry, how would you characterize uh, differences in CDM for the domestic, as an example as you gave, uh, versus the uh, uh, transoceanic or international uh, long haul flights? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, and there's definitely differences. And there, and and let me let me answer that in, in a couple ways. One one is um, there there is a CDM uh, program in Europe. Um, it somewhat mirrors our CDM program in the US. However, it's really not, it's more focused on um, slot times and flow control as opposed to reroutes. Um, and, you know, one of the things that actually we are doing in RTCA is we're trying to create a standard that is kind of, we, we would like a standard that works on both sides of the Atlantic. And our thought is that that would make it more acceptable worldwide. Um, and you know so that that's kind of the that's my first part of the answer is um how how europe works and then when you get to oceanic areas now now we're in a in a different arena um you know uh, i'll use a couple examples one in the, is the north atlantic atlantic uh, with their uh, well nowadays with the reduced traffic there's only uh, um, one track in each direction on the North Atlantic, which for those of us that flew before the pandemic is kind of un un unfathomable because there used to be six or eight or nine in each direction. And uh, and but but they also there's other things that are happening in the North Atlantic. Um, you know, they, they went from, you know, strictly a procedural environment to now they have space based ADSB surveillance essentially have I would call it even better than radar-like surveillance over the North Atlantic, um, and 
And that really has, I think, been a game changer in, in allowing for reduced separation standards. The, the interesting thing is they, they haven't coupled that with the communications to go along with the, the surveillance. So, um, so because of that, there, there's a roadblock to getting to, you know, five mile radar separation or even three mile separation like we have domestically in the U.S. But it's still an example of, uh, you know, it's it's an airspace where today you can do user preferred routing much more readily than you used to be able to do in the North Atlantic. Um, in fact, it's it's rare to actually fly the track on the North Atlantic now. Well, of course, there's only one <laughs> because of the reduced traffic. Um, but let me contrast that to the Pacific, where Oakland Center controls most of you know the uh, eastern Pacific Ocean, uh, you know, from Guam all the way east to the U.S. West Coast, um, and that that airspace, you you uh, there's a lot of flexibility because the traffic density is so low. Um, so things like deviations are pretty easy to accommodate in general, usually, not always. Um, and I would actually say that one exception to that in the Pacific is the what they call the Central East Pacific from the West Coast of the U.S. to Hawaii. Um, and that that airspace is is pretty heavily used. And actually, I, I have a personal example. Of, this is many years ago, probably eight to ten years ago, uh, where there were there's a line of thunderstorms. I think there's like six tracks between the U.S. West Coast and Hawaii and the line of thunderstorms that went across three or four of them that was outside of it was 600 miles northeast of Honolulu. So it was outside of radar coverage. And there, there were actually people on guard uh, on the on VHF 121.5, you know, announcing in the blind that they're deviating without ATC clearance because they just couldn't get through on HF radio. And uh, and it's just it, it was chaos. And so, you know, how do, how do you bring order to that? <laughs> and so the answer to that, Matthias, is you know, in the U.S., we don't have that space-based ADSB yet. Now, there's they're studying it, and they're certainly looking at it as a possibility in the future. But, but until we get that surveillance, um, it'll be difficult to to make the the CDM world in the ocean work as it does in in the domestic U.S. But I think in the end state, in fact, there's a, a group uh, in the ATO who is working on. Uh, uh, oceanic airspace post 2035, which uh, that'll be way past my retirement date. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing about that is you can you kind of that when you look that far in the future, you, you don't really need to consider the transitions. You can kind of look at a clean slate and say, well, if I had whatever ATC system I wanted and whatever CDM system I wanted in this airspace, how would I make it work? And I think the the thing that they are really kind of looking at is you, you don't need to have the tactical control like we have over the domestic US because of the lack of traffic density, except for rare occasions. And and during those rare occasions, being able to zero in on where that active convective weather is and to be able to control that, you know, 500 miles square or whatever uh, in a tactical manner, um, you know, much as we would tactically control around a convective weather event in the continental US. Uh, that that would be really the way to do it, as opposed to the, the way it's done today, which is still procedural. And and e even with CBDLC, it can be difficult to get a clearance. Um, it can be. Um, well, I shouldn't say that it's it's way easier than than high frequency voice. <laughs> um, so. Um, but there are so that that's probably the biggest change that's I see in the future, you know, in the post 2035 time frame in the ocean is there might be the ability to actually zero in on problem areas and then tactically control them as opposed to kind of today they're they're hands off with large deviations allowed and and you know um, altitude separation is is really one of the primary uh, means of, of doing that. So I don't know, Matthias. I I think I've talked. I've rambled on a lot. I don't know if I really specifically answered your question, but but they were all different. The question is, how can we make them as similar as possible? Yeah, you gave me a lot to think about. Thanks. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rocky, we have three more uh, questions here that have come up. One from uh, Jose Garcia. 
um, about uh, rerouting over northern New Mexico on flights like the LA Houston. And I'm assuming, Jose, uh, if you could clarify, I, I used to fly Dallas, uh, Hawaii quite a bit. It would routinely be flying over uh, northern Mexico, but it was not really. Are, are you talking about for a tactical reroute or are you talking about for? or something to request something in an alternative to a playbook route. Um, I guess just to clarify there for uh, for Rocky to answer. Jose. And you'll need to unmute Jose if, if you're there. Well, and, and Rocky, you heard my my comment yeah. there, but I, it just the question simply uh, was uh, how possible or easy is it for you to do that LA Houston uh, to reroute over northern northern Mexico? So, well, let, let me actually. I'm really glad that that question got asked because again, I have another example. I didn't bring it in today, but I, it was a I've flown the uh, Houston to Sydney flight a couple times, uh, which is a way too long flight, and it and it goes through northern Mexico. Usually we head out over Houston, over uh, uh, San Antonio, and then Del Rio, Texas, and then across Mexico. Um, and the the most recent time I flew that, which was last December, um, there was convection over over Central Mexico. And the interesting thing, uh, and actually even my dispatcher during the planning process planned for, you know, what he thought was going to be the best route around convection. And the problem is. You know, in that planning process, you're you know two to three hours prior to takeoff, and convection changes you know can be pretty dynamic, and and then the interesting thing is, you know, right after we took off, our our dispatcher um, had a new suggested route across Mexico, and the one thing that that he was really stressing that that we do is try and coordinate the reroute in U.S. airspace before we got to Mexico, so we didn't have to. Do that coordination with the Mexican controllers, and we actually did that. We actually coordinated a reroute um, with the Houston Center before we left U.S. airspace, um, and and the reroute actually kept us clear of convection and actually made the flight more efficient too. So, um, you know, so the, and you know, each um, air navigation service provider is is going to have their own um, capability. Uh, as to how much they they would be able to accommodate things like this, my my general sense is, you know, in Mexico, although ATC works in English pretty much everywhere, you know, when you get to places like China or the other place that I have trouble understanding is is France, <laughs> uh, understanding the French accent of the U.S. language, um, trying to do complicated voice reroutes uh, is problematic, and you know that's one of the things that I know that the FAA is looking at when they're transitioning, they're looking at the transition to trajectory based operations and being able to automate that, you know, through uh, controller pilot data link communications, um, you know, having a new route in the FMS that you can actually just through a, a few button pushes request a new route and have ATC look at it and evaluate it. And then, in fact, we just finished uh, and United participated in a uh, the 4DT trial that the uh, the FAA actually was a demonstration uh, flown up with the Boeing Eco Demonstrator, which happened to be a 787 this past summer, and uh, and and the whole idea was to, uh, you know, to me, the big thing that they were innovating was rather than just having a an ATC request clearance and then it's either going to be denied or or granted, either as you requested it or with some change, um, they they introduced the whole concept of of putting in a trial route. And, you know, hey, well, if we request this trial trajectory right now, would it be approved? You know, and then um, that that added a whole new dynamic. But again, to, to do that, you need a much more automated system than we have today. Um, you know, I, I think my airline, United, we, we're not even at 50 50 percent uh, airline or aircraft capable of CBDLC. So until we got there, it's going to be difficult. Um, I don't, David, did you want to add a little bit of comments on the Northern Mexico? You have some experience there. Uh, well, 
Uh, no, you, you've covered it well. The only thing I was going to add is your, your comment about uh, requesting routes in areas of the world that where English may not be the primary language and therefore the accents or, uh, or, or the understanding of what you're requesting is uh, not always uh, there. So that, that's where things like CPDLC, um, you know, data link technologies will, will right. benefit this because once you're in uh, like Japan or China, there, there is aviation English, but when you start requesting and they know aviation English, you know, climb to or clear to, but when you start requesting something like uh, a reroute, uh, you're off the script then. So it, it, it yeah. rapidly exceeds their bandwidth for being able to uh, uh, respond to you. But uh, and, and John Kosak, just for the, the rest of the group, did have a comment that, that tagged on to that, that there are um, playbook, uh, playbook routes through Mexico, but like with Canada, it may depend on their workload as to whether or not they let the command center um, uh, use that airspace. So just as an additional comment to that. Um, and, we're, and David, let me follow on with a little bit of a comment too, based on uh, um, well, one of the interesting areas that we fly that has a lot of convection is China. And mm -hmm. and it's really interesting to see how they handle convection in China versus the US. Um, and the interesting thing in China is most of the airspace is owned by the military. So it's really only the the uh, corridors, you know, the civilian, um, the, you know, the route corridors, you know, and, and f that are five to 10 miles wide, you know, that's really all that ATC has. And when, when convection shows up and deviation starts, ATC, China ATC has to go to the military and say, hey, we need more airspace, which, you know, usually they get it because usually when I request deviations in China, I get them, <laughs> but not always. And uh, but there are some interesting things that they do there that it would really be nice to see them done here. Um, and that's, uh, you know, when when you get a convective weather deviation clearance in China here, here in the US, the tactical deviation is, well, I need to turn 10 degrees left. And and ATC doesn't really know, well, how far are you gonna, am I going to go 10 degrees left? And in China, it's OK, you're clear to deviate five miles left, of course. And we can, and again, with our flight management systems, we can put up a line five miles left of the course, and it's very easy for us to deviate right over to it and know what the limit is. And, you know, it, it makes the limit finite as opposed to the way that we do it here. So um, so there's interesting nuances, and, and it, it would really be good to bring, you know, best practices, you know, I can say a lot of bad things about China ATC, but that's one thing that's really good, and it'd really be nice to get their good parts and uh, not the bad parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they love their offsets in in China. Yes. For, yeah, so even when there's not weather, they do lots yeah, of offsets. Well, they actually they actually use offsets to get opposite direction traffic on an airway. They'll tell yeah, everybody yeah. To offset three miles right. You better not screw that up, or you're going to hit somebody. <laughs> yeah, or so, seven anyway. miles right. But anyway. Um, and Bob Swenson had a, uh, a question, probably a little bit tainted by conversations he and I have had here uh, and with Matt. Uh, he mentions that you uh, said it would be nice to allow AOCs to uh, request reroute as currently only the cockpit can. How would that help and can the airline afford the extra dispatcher work? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> De Deb Debbie, don't let me speak, even though I haven't given you your turn yet. But, uh, um, yeah, you know. Uh, you want to jump in there, Rocky? Well, go ahead, Debbie, and then, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, um, actually, with, the, with all the uh, changes coming, uh, all the uh, weather tools to the cockpit, and as that progresses and we get to this point where then this tool is possible as well, um, the dispatcher workload won't be the same as it is exactly now. Um, it, it, overall, it might be the same, but we won't be focusing on the things that we are now, making sure they have updated uh, weather segments, convective segments, things like that. They're going to already have that, and, and we won't have to kind of be wasting time on that. Instead, we can we can uh, definitely turn our attention toward uh, perhaps working out a better route. So I, I see it as a wash personally. I don't know about you, Rocky. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I would say that actually um, some of the tools you actually are, we're implementing some of the tools now with the ability of, of, of a dispatcher to create a, a tra trajectory option set. Um, you know, it's probably, while that's not exactly the same thing as, as being able to propose a new route, I mean, it's similar. And having a dispatcher have that capability as an aircraft is en route um, is something that's kind of new and different. And in fact, I think in the 4DD trial, we actually had uh, Chris Reynolds, our United dispatcher, who was in that trial. Um, he actually did some of the, well, he was playbook scripted to do some of the, the reroute um, trial requests to see whether the a routing would work. And uh, and actually it was, it was interesting because again, they had a coordination between um, the dispatcher, the cockpit and ATC. And, and that was all happening on an IP data link as opposed to, you know, and, and that's that's another thing that, um, you know, there still has to be a very clear line of command and control. And that's the nice thing that CPTLC brings is it's very clear and there's no there's no need to worry about errors and in interpretation. It's it's uh, it's very straightforward. Um, but when you have lots of potential routes that you're trying to, you know, say, hey, does this one work or is another one a little bit better? Um, you know, that's where having that, an, an IP based data link um, would really come in handy. Let's let's see, David, anything else? Thank, thank you for the help, Debbie. If not, you know, yeah, I think one we, of the things. We, we have, I'm sorry, we do have one more. Mike Robinson uh, had a comment or a, a question about thoughts on cockpit CDM that benefits an individual flight, but uh, the possibility of it negatively impacting the system if many pilots simultaneously target the same opportunities. Um, and then how, how would that be uh, uh, maybe addressed? First come, first serve, some type of equity-based protocol, uh, <laughs> or maybe having C coordinator do it. So anyway, well, I'll, I'll I, toss that grenade to you. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a really good grenade. Thank you, Mike, for asking that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you, you know, uh, there's certainly there would have to be some protocol because you, you're right that if you know if there's one 40 mile wide break in the line of thunderstorms and all 50 airplanes simultaneously want to go through it, it's it's just not going to work. Um, and that's something that we really haven't you know we we haven't really developed. Well, what is the protocol for asking how do how do we keep that how do we make this helpful versus disrupted, which is kind of the theme of my whole presentation. Um, and there's some some thoughts that I have are. Um, well, first of all, I got to say these are my own thoughts uh, and. I certainly don't have agreement, you know, from any any kind of industry body, but but. Uh, um, there, there needs to be some kind of, you know. Uh, if, if you have if you have the most current information, then then that's one of the reasons we're trying to establish an RTCA standard for a minimum information content is is to get everybody up to that standard. And if they if you don't have that, well then maybe your request to deviate from a traffic management initiative is going to go into the same bucket that it goes in today, which means it's approved. So today on this playbook routing, you know, even though the the, the first controller gave me my requested reroute, um, I don't think they were supposed to do that. <laughs> they they clearly you know they're 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 responsible for their separation in their sector, and once they go beyond their sector boundaries, to do something that's that's contrary to a traffic management initiative, they they need to get buy-in from their TMU, and and I don't I don't think that occurred, which is why when I got to the next sector, I immediately got snapped back to the the original playbook routing, um, and and actually, but that's one of the things, Mike, that I I really look for this capability to kind of open the door a little bit and say, well, okay, if you have this information, all those who have this information said it should become maybe first come first serve for if you have that information set. And, and you know, and, and again, what I'm really looking for in the big scheme of things is, is, is a way to nudge the system into exiting uh, playbook routings earlier, you know, when, the, when it's appropriate or you know, it it really and in this example flight that I that I had from LA to Houston, it's it's a really good example of, you know, we we really didn't need to fly the playbook routing. I don't think, 
um, and we really should have gotten off of it sooner. And and how do we how do we get those requests to be considered by by the traffic management units that that need to approve that in time so that we don't have to fly an extra hour flight time? But you've asked the key question, and I, I I'll be the first to admit I don't have the complete answer. But I think that even without the complete answer, I, I think there's clearly a way to move forward. Thanks, right, Rocky. Rocky. I think that's um, looks like that's the last of the questions or comments here. Dave, I so, look like uh, Mike. Uh, uh, Mike may have had a follow on. No, uh, I was just saying. Uh, oh, okay. Yep. Well, with that, uh, I know uh, Roger Sultan is is next on the list, and I don't. I know you don't have a presentation, but Roger, you you were you know on the FAA flight standard side involved in, in this topic for a long time. Um, do you have any comments on, you know, yeah. how, how can we be more helpful in the cockpit? Yeah, well, I got, I got a lot of things written down. I don't know, if, do we want to take a break before we go into that? Um, yeah. Why don't, well, we, we've got about three hours and um, it might be better to keep going now and then maybe have a break before we have Debbie and John talk. Okay. That, that that's fine with me um so as rocky you know I, i'm here representing the airline pilots association uh, not the faa though i do have a lot of faa experience and uh did did sit in on the cdm meetings for god five years or so um but that being said uh, you know as as a another united pilot here like rocky uh with that cdm experience that i have I, I don't I don't know uh, how that translates into making the, the system work. So some of the things I wrote down based off of seeing Rocky's um, presentation a couple of days ago was, you know, the masks uh, from 206 would be for aircraft technology. Um, and, and Rocky kind of mentioned this, but how do the flight crews use it or how do they integrate it into their everyday work? There, there's going to be challenges. Um, on the ground and then more challenges in the air that that we really need to fo that that i don't know 206 would have to focus on uh and i i don't know if if 206 has outside of a few pilots has the, the expertise to focus on something like that uh the next statement i have here is um we'd have to assume that each carrier that would make the investment in, in some sort of technology would then train their pilots in a manner that might be different than each other uh, and then possibly purchase some sort of techno technological system that would be different from each other. So United might have an investment in, in one system, American might invest in something else. And this is, the, the systems would have to talk to each other uh, in some manner through the air traffic control computers. Otherwise, we would have 50 airplanes trying to fly through the same hole at the same time and weather kind of thing. Um, and a uh, you know, big question is, uh, and again, this is kind of touched on, how, how will ATC react to the request to deviate from a TMI? As, as he, Rocky said, you know, one sector might say, absolutely deviate here, you're clear, direct this point uh, 500 miles down the line. And then you, you switch sectors, you switch centers, and uh, they they turn you right back to where you originally cleared to. So a lot of questions there. Uh, Rocky did mention some preferential treatment for best equipped. Uh, a, a major concern is how is that working now? It's not working now for the aircraft that are best equipped. I can't get an RMP approach into Denver uh, because five other aircraft around me are not equipped and I've got to fly a 30 mile downwind to a 30 mile final where I could have flown a nice eight mile curve on the final and saved a lot of gas. So the, 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 the FAA air traffic system is not flexible now for something that they've kind of promised, for, you know, best equipped, best served, and, it, and it's not happening. Um, are, are we focusing right now for longer domestic flights? How, you know, three hours or more? Are we looking at uh, you know North border, a, a Dulles to Boston flight using some CDM techniques? 
or are we just look, focusing on maybe some of the transcons or pseudo transcons like in LA, Chicago, that kind of thing, that we need to, to put parameters around this or maybe do this in stages where we'd focus on uh, longer flights first and then move it into shorter flights or vice versa. Um, as Rocky stated, ATC is slow to react. Um, you know, the whole CDM system is slow to react, so get them to speed up. Um, yeah, another thing that was mentioned was that star segment, um, where you can deviate before or after the star segment, but you can't deviate off of the star segment, is what I understood. Uh, that's something I had no idea of. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I have five, six years of working in the CDM uh, community, and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know that that was possible. And, and as a pilot, I don't know what, what portion is the star segment. Uh, so there's a lot of education that's going to have to be put out there um, that they'll have to be standardized. As I said, the, the training at United would probably be different than the training at American. would be different than the Delta. And I don't know how we, how we get that to be standardized. Um, I, I've had... You know, off the cuff here, I've had plenty of uh, flights where I, I've gotten a, 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 you know, a planned long, long route deviation, let's say Dulles to uh, Vegas to Dulles, where the flight's supposed to be maybe three hours and 45 minutes. And uh, due to thunderstorms in the Midwest, I'm now, you know, flying down to El Paso, Texas, and then across a portion of the Gulf into Louisiana. Um, and then, and then, and then hitting Dulles from Atlanta up from the south, the south routes, uh, adding hour, hour and a half to my routing, only to have when I show up at the airport. You know, this the the plan was made two hours ago. I show up at the airport an hour before, 45 minutes before flight. Look at the routing. Look at the amount of gas I have, and then look at the weather. And you know, El Paso. Texas, all the weather's now over El Paso, Texas, and now, you know, in the, in the short 45 minutes that I have to prepare the flight and get the, the fuel loads correct, I got to call dispatch, talk to talk to the dispatcher, see if uh, things can be changed, but no, the, the traffic initiative in the Midwest, because of the storms, is still on, and, you know, basically told, you know, take, take all that fuel on board, have to do a flaps one, bleeds off, take off out of uh, Vegas, um, because we're so heavy and it's so hot there and, 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 and just deal with ATC once you get airborne. And, that, and that's kind of how, how things are, that's how things work right now. Um, or, or let's say last year, not right now, uh, cause there's no traffic right now, but, um, so there, there's lots of challenges to, to making this work now, you know, I think we're up for it, but this is a, uh, you know, put a time frame around this. This is probably a 10 plus year type initiative that, um, that that's going to be challenging. So that, that's hey. kind of what I, those are the things I wrote down, uh, which I think just brings up more discussion points. Uh, I don't really have any answers to them right now. Well, Roger, um, I, I, I appreciate those. And I, and I, I want to highlight a couple of them because I think they're key. And one, one is standardization and training. And that's one of the reasons why we're working, doing what we're doing in, in RTCA is we are trying to at least have a, have a minimum starting point for what information content you need to be even involved, to even have your, you know, toe in the door or whatever. Um, and, and your comments on the divergence of training between airlines, I mean, yes, that's, that's an issue not only with what we're talking about here today, but with you know many many things and the the more differently us airlines do things that then we become less predictable to atc and therefore you know that that adds to their workload and 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 everything else but and i you know the other thing i guess i would comment roger to you is is that i'm you know i i may have sounded as if i, I want to do this as a wholesale big change but i think one of the real keys is we need to find ways, little ways to make this start working so that we can, you know, yeah. 
enter and exit traffic management issues more efficiently. Yeah, and I agree. I think we have to bite off. We have to identify what we want to bite off first. Yeah, uh, and and I do think, and it's not just you know, despite the 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 session title of this being cockpit tools, it's not just the cockpit. It's it's our dispatchers. It's the ATC coordinators at the airlines. It's all of us. How, how do we get at, to work as a team? And and then the traffic, you know, the the command center. How how do we get all get on the pa same page? And that's that's the challenge. Um, and and um, you know, if, if I came across as, as wanting us to change wholesale tomorrow, I mean, I probably didn't. It, I agree yeah. with you. This is a ten plus year change process. Now I, I had one more comment. I, I didn't uh, have it written down. I must have skipped over it. Uh, I sit on another panel as an Alpha representative on something called the uh, CNS, which is Communication, Navigation, and Surveillance, and it's a group of uh, all the airlines plus air traffic control and um, and not just FAA, but there'll be Nav Canada and there'll be European folks there, and and also OEMs like Honeywell and and Rockwell or Collins, I guess, and and all that kind of thing. And I've seen presentations on software on iPads. And I believe Alaska Airlines did some trials with this where the software would talk to the air traffic control system and find the best routes around existing weather, including uh, traffic initiatives. And, you know, that would probably be the only way to to make this work is to have a, you know, a system that everyone uses so you can't just go you know you'd have to it'd have to be almost like one vent maybe controlled by the faa with with multiple vendors where the information is is bounced off each other and and let's say united gets two flights ahead of alaska but then alaska gets a couple slots and then american gets a couple slots and delta gets a couple slots that way everyone gets a fair shake i don't know how 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 exactly that software works but the the presentations that I've seen about it, um, you know, were interesting um, and and seems so feasible moving forward. Yeah, um, Alaska did do a demonstration of the Tazar system, the NASA system, which was a route route optimizer. Um, you know, and, and that that tool was, uh, you know, it's traffic aware strategic strategic air crew request tool, um, which is Tazar, the acronym. Uh, it it didn't do the coordination that you described of uh, you know, what's the most optimum route. And actually, even this last, um, you know, the FA sponsored a 4DT trial or demonstration this summer really didn't go that far. It was still dispatchers and pilots working together to create route requests, but they were in the form of trial requests first. So you would you'd float the trial first, and then after you floated the trial, then you would, you know, you know, if you got a thumbs up and and there nothing else looked more efficient later on, then you would, you could you could uh, you turn that trial request into okay, well I'd like to execute this now. Um, but I think actually, Roger, I think you and I agree on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but none of it's going to be easy. Um, yeah. That's that's for sure. Um, I didn't, Debbie, did you? Do we want to try and wrap up the airline and then uh, maybe we'll have a break after that and then go to. Uh, John, did you have any other comments or remarks, Debbie, from the airline point of view, from the dispatch? Yeah, point? sure, sure. Um, yeah, we can absolutely do that. Mine aren't mine aren't too long, but uh, basically, first I wanted to talk about um, you know the process as it is now. Um, I don't know if everyone's aware, but basically the ATC uh, advisories come out for the required routes. Of course, the ATC coordinators uh, uh, might suggest something to the command center, but they always have 51% of the vote. So uh, they're going to put out those required routes. Um, then um, the um, dispatcher can request um, through their ATC coordinator um, who then uses the TCA page, part of the uh, uh, FAA's OIS page, to uh, see if we can't maybe get a route out of that required ATC reroute. Generally speaking, those will be done for critical flights. Um, and what I mean by that are ones where maybe the 
crew's going to time out if they do that early around. Um, maybe they just will. Uh, we have lots of different types of airplanes uh, at United Airlines, and some of them, sometimes it, it, it can't quite do all these great big playbook routes uh, that are pushed, put out for, for that uh, fleet type. Um, again, payload critical. I think uh, you all, Roger, was definitely just talking about the payload critical and runway performance. Um, so when any we see some of those situations, we might start working on that before we even talk to the pilot and part of the problem um, because we'll go ahead and, and maybe work on that with the ATC coordinator. And of course, like Rocky pointed out, it was maybe even hours out. Um, then by the time the pilot comes in, the weather has changed again. They take a look at it, and if they don't buy in, that's the third leg of the stool. So uh, it doesn't work um, if all three of us aren't, aren't working together on, on all of it. So um, also, uh, let me see. Uh, I had uh, written down here, um, oh, yeah, the current tools also um, that, we're, um, that we're using. Um, the uh, TSD tool, uh, the ATC coordinator, certainly using those with the command center. That'll show the uh, constrained areas and the required reroutes. Um, but that's a, a tool that takes up a lot of the memory and space. I can't see that actually working uh, on Rocky's iPad uh, in the airplane. Again, maybe maybe that. Maybe a piece of that comes into this new tool, whatever it's going to be. I know um, uh, MITRE has been experimenting with a uh, NOD tool, and alternate pathfinder uh, is part of that. And the ATC coordinator, again, can work with the, the dispatchers to find some critical flights. Part of the nice part about that is they get buy-in from the crew first um, before they go ahead and, and approve that route. That's part of the ground rules there. Um, and speaking of ground rules, uh, I think uh, you all already touched on it, but obviously uh, if we could all ever get on the same page with the same tool, um, that's that would be absolutely critical. Um, and yeah, there are some companies out there also working on the uh, tools um, for the input. Uh oh, Debbie, we, may, we just lost you. It may have been your internet. Debbie, uh, as much as I like looking at you, maybe maybe kill your video and that'll give you enough bandwidth for us to hear you. And you're muted yeah, team, now. Team, teams is kind of a bandwidth I'm fog. I'm back? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's yeah, why you're back. I didn't feel my video yeah. when I was talking. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um... Yeah, it can be a, a bit of a bandwidth hog. So, uh, so same as the TSD tool. Uh, so definitely uh, uh, a nice tool uh, would certainly show some of those constrained areas, but I, I don't know whether that one. And uh, Debbie, Debbie got muted again, we, but I, I do want to. And if she can hear me, she might be able to comment on this in a minute. I, I do want to comment on one thing that that you mentioned, Debbie, and that's the the tool that you have to request uh, with ATC SCC um, a deviation from a traffic management initiative uh, before the flight departs. Um, I, and I forget that I think you used TAC was the acronym you used for that tool for that request. And and as an example of one of the baby steps that I think I would like to see would be, hey, can we extend that tool because that tool is no longer used once the aircraft is in the air. Um, and and my flight, the example that I flight that I flew from Houston or LA to Houston was a perfect example of that would have been a great tool to have um, in place for even after the aircraft was airborne to, to try, again, try and nudge the system. So that would be an example of, you know, can, can we use this one tool that already exists and extend it from being a pre-flight only tool to a, a pre-flight and an in-flight tool. And Debbie, I didn't mean to cut, cut you off, but that was just a thought. No, yes, that's that's exactly uh, exactly right. Um, the TAC um, is primarily just um, 
that's the desk at the uh, command center. Um, so they they part of the OIS page, the sign in that the airlines use, the ATC coordinators, instead of calling repeatedly to the same desk and the same person, uh, basically do a little text format on that page and uh, request uh, that it gets routed out. Um, that is a cumbersome process because obviously it's one person working that desk at the command center. So they take one request at a time. You can watch and it'll turn blue when they're working on it. It might take a while to turn blue. And then when they do, obviously they have to then coordinate with all the TMUs uh, along the way, make sure they get buy-in all along the way. That can take 10, 15 minutes some days um, for them to get back to us. Then the ATC coordinator will tell the dispatcher, yes, uh, that's that's an approved route. Um, and we usually put in the remarks section that it's TMU approved so that hopefully you won't get that sort of uh, uh, rerouting uh, that you had there over Arizona or, or uh, by New Mexico <laughs> where they snapped you back onto the, uh, onto the play book route, hopefully they would keep you on that um, that new TMU approved uh, route. But yeah, those are those are pretty much before departure. Um, once it gets to uh, after departure, I know some companies are working on some tools. You all were were touching on those a little bit, where they will um, give the pilots and the dispatcher suggested routes that will probably be approved, and that's more or less. I, from my understanding from those companies, it's more or less um, done by experience. They have a lot of uh, past ATC folks working with them and they can kind of say, well, the generally this will be approved by ATC, that one won't, uh, just due to a lot of the uh, uh, different agreements maybe between centers or, or other things that are going on. Um, but it isn't a true by like like you were talking about, Rocky, with that TAC uh, uh, kind of tool or uh, once if we could get the true buy-in, yes, this is going to be an approved route and, of course, quickly, that all three of us would, yes, see the same thing. I think that's, that's the number one uh, uh, thing we need in the ground rules, that we all need to be on the same same tool, same map, same, same thing, uh, looking at the same page would be absolutely essential to it. OK, and, thanks. Thanks, Devin. And Rocky, Rocky uh, Gary Codner has been patiently waiting here. And, and to the whole group, um, if you raise your hand and we don't see it immediately, throw something in the comments saying that you have your hand raised or something. Unfortunately, in Teams, uh, when you're monitoring the chat, you can't see the hand raised. And on my second device, uh, it only shows about eight or 10 names at once. And if you're down the list with your hand raised, it doesn't show it there. So I apologize, Gary, you had your hand up and then you put it back down. But anyway, Gary's question is uh, for Rocky, what recommendations, um, uh, what, what do you perceive as being the measure for overall NAS uh, improvement with the recommendations that you're stating? And for example, total, total delay time uh, being minimized, uh, most lights, on time, even if a few have delays, uh, gas emissions tied to fuel efficiency and so forth. So, <laughs> well, uh, Gary's asking a very good question. Um, you know, and and I'm not going to give the the end all be all answer. I think certainly the uh, um, you know delay minutes or reduction in delay minutes. You know, but it's unrealistic to to say you're going to go down to zero because I mean, with convective weather, you're going to have delay minutes. It's a question of can we do better than we do now. Um, but, you know, I think, Gary, I, you, you mentioned another metric, which would also probably be good. Uh, um, flight delays, I think it was, David, uh, you know, or departure delays. I mean, all, all those would be good. You know, I, in general, I think from the airline standpoint, we are looking to have more schedule integrity in the system than we have today. You know, so in other words, we really would like, you know, the, the way that my old COO used to uh, stated was we really want you know the low ceiling visibility days to be blue sky weather days i mean to, to be like blue sky weather days and and whatever we can to you know and whatever metrics you choose to, to measure that by um that's really the goal is to, to make it better um 
I'm not and again. I'm Gary. I'm not sure I really directly answer your question, but uh, that's a shot at it. I do think, um, you know, we do have a break scheduled in here. We probably now might be a good time, and then we'd have John give his presentation from NBAA. One other thing that I do want to have some free form discussion on after that, because it wasn't really specifically in my slide set, is I would like a little bit of discussion around. Well, what are the tools that would be productive? In, in for cockpit use primarily, um, you know, because I don't think that they really exist today, at least in it, maybe in the weather world they exist, but in the traffic flow management world, they don't really exist. Um, so with that, I propose that we take a little break now and then come back with John and then may, maybe a discussion on our future requirements development. John Kozak, uh, he, he's the one of the NBA representatives of the Air Traffic Control System Command Center. And you want to give us a perspective uh, from NBAA on this issue. All right. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Can you see my NBAA business aviation slide? Sweet. All right. So uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for continuing to support the effort that is Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather. Uh, it's my turn to share a few thoughts with you from the business aviation side of things. These thoughts are based on some of the original questions posed by Rocky and others as we began looking into this topic, as well as some of the ideas and questions that Rocky discussed today in his most recent presentation. And yes, Rocky, some of those questions were provocative, but not in a bad way. So um, you pose a question, are systemic and individual flight efficiency possible? Um, and I think the short answer is yes. The long answer is it's complicated. This is at least two separate questions, if not more. Uh, it's also a bit philosophical. Are you like Spock and believe that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one? Uh, this generated a lot more questions for me, such as how much effort will we make to save time uh, in the air for a single aircraft? How many people have to be involved? Uh, is it just gonna be the pilot and the local controller? Or do we have to reach out beyond the local controller and look at the downline impacts? Can we collaborate proactively on changes to flights well before they get into the impacted airspace, uh, like your flight from LAX to Houston, uh, or one or two centers in advance? Uh, potentially, this could free up ATC bandwidth in order to increase efficiency and therefore reduce the burdens across the entire national airspace system. Uh, going forward, we should have the capability to be proactive uh, instead of reactive. So uh, currently CDM is ground centric with primary participation from air traffic control and airline operations center. So my response to that is OK, but what if I don't have an airlines operations center? What if I'm a single pilot operating in the national airspace system at that point? The flight deck is my operation center. <laughs> I may be my own line person, scheduler, dispatcher, not to mention the pilot. Uh, so what is CDM going forward? Is it an individual pilot who operates their aircraft? Uh, I'm sorry, is an individual pilot who operates their aircraft going to have to sign an LOA or an MOU in order to participate? Um, I think this kind of goes along with the question that Mike Robinson asked a little bit earlier, maybe a little different version, but again, more questions. Uh, is there going to be required equipage? If so, what is that based on? The size or the type of the aircraft? Um, the size or the type of the fleet? Uh, the type of operation, be it Part 91K, 135, 125, or plain old Part 91? Is there any advantage to excluding NAS users because they are not CDM signatories. Uh, what about the business aviation aircraft in New York TRACON that's willing, able, and fueled to take non-standard routing, including the low-level escape routes like the Sermon routes out of New York? Are we going to make them wait until the weather clears and put them on the PREF route with all the other traffic that couldn't take the Sermon route because they couldn't fuel for it? Maybe in the future, everyone becomes a CDM member. Um, there will always be some aircraft and crews that are better equipped and better trained, but I'm not sure we want to give preferential treatment to equipage over potential flexibility. Uh, we're going to have to think outside the box. Um, of course, that brings us to another conundrum. Uh, 
what coordination is required between the cockpit and the AOC? Well, uh, what if there is no cockpit? <laughs> uh, we're here talking about the emerging weather technology for the flight deck, but what if there is no flight deck? Think about this for a moment. UAM pilots may have some of the best equipped, quote unquote, so-called flight decks because they'll have access to almost anything they could ever want on the ground where they are paying less for access because they aren't having to get that information to or from an aircraft of flight, whether that be, uh, be via SATCOM or some other method. Are we going to give them the best access because they are technically the best equipped and or informed? So more, um, cockpit participation in reroutes has been mostly limited to tactical avoidance along the current route of flight. Uh, so, you know, deviate for weather, report back on course. Deviate for weather, report back on course. Uh, how many times might a crew do this in a single flight? Um, you know, Rocky showed us a couple examples before where that orange line, there were numerous orange lines from all the reroutes. Um, if we do have access to weather on the flight deck, how do we use it for the good of all? Uh, Rocky's deviation slides are a good example of individual flights, but imagine if we can do that for more aircraft. Uh, or if we could spread the aircraft out along similar routes side by side, like aircraft departing the airport on different headings in order to move more aircraft off the ground more quickly. We might still end up with 30 miles in trail, but if we have three separate routes offset along a main route, the impact would only feel like 10 miles in trail. Just a thought. This would be Airborne CTOP or Collaborative Trajectory Options Program. Again, we're going to have to think outside the box. That's becoming a theme. So uh, outside the box thinking, um, the Colorado camera program allows pilots not only to view weather conditions in real time, but to play back a loop of past images to analyze weather trends. The website provides one stop access to METARS tasks, pilot reports, radar imagery and more. My boss, Heidi Williams, MBA's Director of Air Traffic Services and Infrastructure, is kind of excited about this, as you might be able to tell from her quote. We've learned from the Alaska Weather Camera Program how critical weather cameras are for pilots. This is the logical expansion of a low-cost program that has been very successful in areas with frequent adverse weather conditions. These cameras provide real-time information in critical areas where live weather information was not available previously. Imagine being able to pull that up on arrival into that area uh, and getting the most accurate, up-to-date uh, information. So I'm going to end up in kind of the same place that, that Rocky did. Um, broadband weather is coming to the cockpit, whether we plan for it or not. So um, business aircraft come in so many different shapes and sizes from a single engine like a Cessna 172 up to the slightly more complex Boeing business jet. Uh, we also have different types of helicopters in addition to the quickly emerging sector that is UAS and UAM. And I'm gonna change my slide now, see. <laughs> um, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts from our members about some of the benefits and pitfalls of this new era. Um, these are based on some of the questions posed by the updated outline uh, Rocky put forth uh, a few weeks back for this session. Uh, these will also demonstrate the wide variety of business aviation users, as one note is from a G450 driver at a fractional operator, uh, while another is from a director of a company that uses a single Pilatus PC-12 single engine turboprop, and the third is from a pilot who tra helps train and educate other pilots. So first from our G450 driver, um, we can pull ground radar images using SATCOM Direct for just about any area of the world from any point over the globe. We can pull METAR and TAF using the same SATCOM. We have push messages coming in for Sigma for our flight planned route for things like turbulence. As we have the international Wi-Fi system installed on the rest of the fleet, um, their globals and G650s already have this, we have the full functionality of the four flight EFB as well as other uh, any other weather apps and resources. If he brings along his Sentry, he has the ADSB data stream available to any other user in the aircraft, and I think that mostly involves the ForeFlight app. Um, he suspects that the global internet access 
that the SpaceX Starlink constellation is going to provide will really push the availability of data to the limits of easy and affordable access. Next, from our PC-12 driver, uh, we conduct both single and crew operations on our PC-12, so we see both sides of the coin. I would call our cockpit tech gear pretty standard for 2020. We do have GoGo Wi-Fi, and we've been able to integrate it effectively into the cockpit. As far as built-in equipment, we have XM weather that displays on the MFD. We use ForeFlight with JEP charts and use the aircraft's Wi-Fi with that app for two main functions. One is obtaining DATIS information where available, and the second is using the NEXRAD to complement the XM weather product. Yes, at times they are different uh, to make broad weather decisions. Neither are a substitute for the eyeball and the onboard radar. Uh, one thing they have been very careful to avoid, especially single pilot, is tech overload in the cockpit. Uh, I see single pilot operators with iPads mounted in the cockpit and multiple apps open. We have operating policies that dictate the iPad only be out when necessary, for instance, during ground ops, departure, arrival, and other navigational tasks. Rule of thumb being, if you would need paper charts, use the iPad. If not, put it away. I feel the overuse of tech causes a safety concern and takes away from the critical duties of flying and monitoring the airplane. When operating crude, we also enjoy the ability for the pilot monitoring to be able to make a phone call to the FBO, giving them an update. We find it much easier than trying to call them on the radio. We also operate internationally, and on those trips, we do not have Wi-Fi, and you soon realize how valuable a tool it is. We have found that we must spend additional time on the pre-flight planning to ensure that we have the most up-to-date weather before we launch. Uh, and finally, this is from our uh, pilot trainer. Um, I'll let my comments wander in two different directions. The first involves general aviation pilots who are actively using the NAS. What I've noticed this summer is, as I've been providing flight reviews and instrument proficiency checks for pilots in my area, is the increased amount of gadgets in the cockpit. Things like iPads, suction mounted to the side window or Velcroed to the yoke, portable Garmin GPS units with XM weather receivers and 12 volt power cords strung across the glare shield, Stratus ADS-B receivers in various positions and a wide range of panel mounted GPS MFD NAVCOM units. For EFB software, I've seen iPads loaded with ForeFlight, Garmin Pilot, iFly and JetView. I'm sure that when the pilot was browsing through Sporty's catalog, they could picture how this particular item would help their situational awareness in the cockpit during that dark and stormy flight. And if one iPad is great, a spare Garmin is even better. But what I've noticed when ATC changes the route, the multiple EFB slant GPS units get out of sync or they have so many redundant moving maps that they are truly saturated with too much information and that their primary task of flying a precise course suffers. Also available, uploaded data from ADS-B towers or XM weather leaves room for improvement. Displays are pixelated and latency is high. The message that I repeat to these pilots is A, keep it simple, and B, you must understand all the functions of your primary EFB software and panel mounted GPS unit. It's many structure and data within. So secondly, how does this keep it simple approach tie into newer technology currently available? The biggest item that I think will truly offer a benefit is high-speed broadband. Many of the new graphical weather products are web-based, which offer greater, uh, great graphics, but are not currently integrated into the menus of the certified panel-mounted NAVCOM units. Software like ForeFlight can access these charts and assist a pilot in making a route or destination decision, but only if connected to the internet. A big emphasis item several years ago by the FAA was the time of arrival landing assessment, SAFO. They encouraged flight crews to ask themselves, how has the weather changed since we departed and can we still safely land at our desti intended destination? Having an internet connected cockpit makes this touch much more streamlined. So uh, there are entire new segments, this is me now, <laughs> there are entire new segments of aviation that are going to be part of this ever changing puzzle that we're trying to solve. It's a moving target, and this might be one of those opportunities that FPA has been looking for, where we put together a team that meets on a more regular basis and brings together all the stakeholders from across the different industries. 
because it's going to require the participation of everyone across the aviation and weather communities to sort this out. After that, we still need to educate the end users on how to operate in this new environment and how proper participation will benefit them, their operations, and the entire NAS. So if anybody needs it, uh, this is my contact information. And, uh, whoops. I just killed my window. There we are. Well, thank you, John. Um, and David, do we have any questions for John? Um, Gordy, uh, uh, Gordy Crocker, had I get a uh, uh, one consideration is uh, are there? That's better. Uh, yeah, Gordy Rother, one thing for serious consideration of the roles, responsibilities, ramifications of mixing them. Uh, says I'm sure Gary can attest to the fact that uh, more information is not necessarily safe for evolution of the airspace and collaboration is certainly key to increase efficiency without sacrificing safety by overburdening the pilot. Um, but it looks like that's the only comment that we've had uh, come in. Um, yeah, I, I do want to comment. Uh, I'll, I'll add a couple things. One, one is, I, um, it, it does strike me how similar are the overall need is whether you're, you know, a, operating a system one seventy two or a, a Pilatus or, a, you know, a, a G six fifty or something like that. Um, you know, we still want flexibility to operate the most efficient route or as efficient a route as possible. And how, how do we achieve that? And I think, you know, John's constituent is kind of unique in that they don't have a dispatcher working in tandem with them. And and so therefore, um, you know, more of it falls on the actual on the pilot, it, you know, and, and what he or she can do. Um, and that's kind of a unique situation. But again, I think that uh, again, when I'm when I fall back to the standards development effort that uh, RTCA is doing in, in SC two hundred six, it's it's we're really trying to develop a standard that that will work um, in all airspaces for all operators. So so you know we're we have the Europeans involved uh, trying to you know make it make a standard that it will will work over for their airspace but but i also think it's important that that our standard is going to work for the the business aviation pilot you know the in a single single cockpit and i think a lot of what you mentioned of you know information overload i mean th those are really big issues uh you know we really you know it's bad enough in the airline world where we have two pilots and you know we can we can divvy it up a little bit you know have one pilot being the pilot flying and the pilot monitoring can spend a little bit more time doing research um, as to, you know, what's ahead and and what are the possibilities. But in a single pilot cockpit, you really don't have that luxury. Um, and how, how do you, you know, what what involvement, if any, and how, how do you execute that involvement uh, in a safe manner? Um, but John, it's... We, go ahead. We, we also don't have the advantage of having wonderful people like Debbie backing us up back at the, the home office either. So, <laughs> right, right. And. But, you know, the the, the interesting thing, John, your, your comments about, uh, you know, are we really going to base access on um, a criteria? And that's really a, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and it kind of kind of like what I, I've been I've been wishy-washy on a lot of things and that's partly because I don't have the answers but I but I kind of have a feeling for what a good way to move forward would be and and I certainly do think that you know having having set a minimum information criteria and then if you meet that criteria then then at least you know your request could be considered as as opposed to today today you know theoretically if if I'm involved in a TMI 
uh, and I'm asking for something other than a local deviation, um, my request is supposed to not even be considered. It's supposed to, you know, I can, it, it would take coordination with the TMU, with the controller of the TMU, or I'd have to go through my dispatcher who'd have to go through the ATC desk, who'd have to go to the command center and kind of do manually what Debbie described as the TAC process for, and, you know, how, how can we do that uh, um, efficiently? That's that's the question. So um, if sorry, I, just a real quick no, note. Um, uh, I don't necessarily disagree with you on the requirements so much as calling them requirements. I, I don't know if maybe recommendations might not be a better uh, way to go about that. Um, because again, uh, you know, you've got so Sorry, I got muted. Uh, I, I think that uh, recommendations might be a better way to go than requirements, um, just from the simple fact that uh, there's so many different sizes and types like I was talking about out there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, like I said at the very end, it, it's going to take everybody putting their heads together to figure out how to make this work. OK, good. Well, thank you, John. Thanks for your inputs. That's very good. I, we we do have some time left, and I don't have any more formal slides, but I but I would like to spend a little. Uh oh, I would like to spend a little bit of time discussing, uh, you know, requirements for cockpit displays or cockpit information, um, and and the reason I'd, I'd like to do this is partly because some of the comments actually that John just brought up of, you know, pilot workload and. Uh, you know, information overload. Um, you know, we don't, you know, and we, we have those issues. We also have the bandwidth issue. Um, we also, even, even uh, you know, I can tell you, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I can tell you my airline, we're 100% of our aircraft are equipped with uh, Wi-Fi for the passengers, which we in the cockpit can piggyback on. However, the, the system is available approximately 78% of the time. So that means, you know, and and some of them, they just don't work 100% of the time, but a lot, you know, but 78% is is the number at my airline for how often those broadband Wi-Fi systems are available, and that's certainly it's not enough to be something that you can rely on. In other words, you you couldn't write a a requirement that said, hey, well, you have to have this system uh, available 100% to to be able to do this. You know, it's if you have the the availability and you have the proper products, then you can uh, make a request that may be contrary to a TMI. Um, but I but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the products themselves, and and I'd actually like to start on the non-weather side, which I won't spend a lot of time on this because I know it's a weather conference. But but you know the the one issue that is really uh, the key issue is is not overloading the controller, and so. You know there are, and I and I forget. Uh, there there are uh, sector loading um, computations that are done in the in the individual sectors at each center, and I think they're done in, in like 15 minute increments out to a couple hours, or I'm, I may have the technical details wrong, but they're not dynamic. They don't really account for complexity. You know, is are, are is all the traffic you know on route you know individual flows and routes or is it random um you know is the convection actually affecting that sector itself um so i, I mean there's a lot of factors that it really doesn't consider um and i think that's one key product that that's really missing and and actually that kind of a product i think would be useful not only in the cockpit but i think it'd be extremely useful in the airline operations center to our ATC desk folks so that they had a, a better idea of, you know, okay, well, where where is the workload um, for ATC? Um, so that that's one one product. Another product is, uh, you know, in the examples I gave, they were all centered around convection. And, you know, there are convective weather products that are out there that are really pretty good. And then there's some that are not. <laughs> um, and, you know, What's key is being able to predict where where the convection will be 
in the future when I arrive there, you know, especially if it's 500 miles down down line, that's, you know, roughly an hour or, or more, you know, in front of me, you know, will that break in the line at storm still be there or will it be closing up over the time frame as I'm en route? And that's actually one of the things that I, that I sometimes talk about is the uh, temporality of this information, you know, and and the reason I, I talk about that is, you know, us pilots, when we look at our airborne weather radar, I mean, the effective range of that is maybe 150 miles. I mean, manufacturers will tell you they go out to 300 miles, but, you know, it's really maybe 150 miles and and the really effective range is inside 100 miles. Um, the closer you get, the better the picture you get. And, and the interesting thing is um, the weather doesn't change very much from when we first see it to when we get there. So there's really not a temporality issue there. It doesn't change. And when we start looking at weather that's in front of the aircraft, that that's going to be different. Um, and it's, it's going to involve training and rec pilot, pilots being able to recognize, well, hey, if I'm looking at this far down the route of flight, I need to look at this many minutes ahead in the convective forecast. Um, and, and one of the issues that we're really wrestling with in, in SC-206 is specifying how good, how do you, how do you define what a good convective forecast is versus one that's not so good? And, and as an example, there are companies out there that, that produce convective forecasts where they, they don't reinitiate, you know, they're, they're not now casts. They're, they're not like the, uh, the GTG 3.0 now cast that, uh, NCAR has where there's a convective component and, and every 15 minutes, you know, that gets reinitialized. There are other convective products out there where, you know, there's a forecast never gets reinitialized. And so when you get to the, it, it's three hours old, we can not even resemble reality because it, it was never reinitialized based on, you know, what the weather was actually doing. Um, and so those, those are the kind of challenges that we're working on in SC206 is to trying to define what those are. Hey, are there any comments or, or questions along uh, what would be minimum requirements for um, an airborne system? So Rocky, this is Kozak again, and I, I have a uh, um, comment on that. I put a note in the uh, box there that, so we just need a deterministic convective forecast product that updates every five minutes with a super high resolution covering an eight hour period, um, sort of like a super version of the uh, TCF. Um, and, you know, I, I guess that comes back to a problem for me, which is, are we making pilots meteorologists again? Are we making uh, ATC people meteorologists by putting out, um, you know, um, graphical radar forecasts versus something that maybe is a little more yes, no oriented. Uh, you know, obviously it's not going to be right all the time, but if we pick something that's going to be right more often than not, uh, and again, the reason I bring up the TCF is because it is the um, tool that is used uh, throughout the industry to make those, you know, initial route decisions, right, wrong or indifferent right now. Um, that's where we're at. But so anyway, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. OK, thank you. Thank you, John. David, do we have any other comments or questions? Uh, Matt Eckstein uh, has a uh, comment. Disagree that forecast needs to be deterministic. Uh, the depiction actionable guidance for crews should be uh, but probabilistic forecast could absolutely be valuable. <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, we could spend a lot of time debating that. Um, I can tell you, uh, as a pilot, I have to make a deterministic decision. Am I going to turn my airplane left or right? Am I going to go up or down? And, you know, at the end of the day, um, that's that's the decision. And while I agree there is valuable information in a, in a probabilistic forecast, um, you know, the, the question is how do you, how do we as a pilot make an actionable decision on it? Um, 
So, so Rocky, this is Matt, and Matt Eckstein is continuing to type. Uh, Matt, can, Matt Eckstein, can you uh, unmute yourself and, and let's have a bit of a conversation around this? This is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want it to just turn into. T um, but yeah, I think it's a really good conversation. I think, you know, if you look just at uh, you know the safety management system for airlines, we make. Uh, all kinds of we we uh, define all kinds of thresholds or actionable guidance based on our tolerance of a uh, combination of probability and severity, right? For all kinds of different safety things. So <clears throat> I think that can be done on the application side, but the forecast, you know, to me, and you know, fully acknowledge that I'm not an expert on the forecasting, but I believe the output of the forecast could absolutely be probabilistic. And then on the solution side, you could say you know, at a 30% probability of this EDR value, we can't tolerate that. So you just tell the pilot, you know, red or yellow. And so all they see is, okay, I'm supposed to secure here or avoid here. They don't care what's going on beyond that. They just need to know what to do with it. Um, but the, the underlying technology is a probability and a severity combination. Um, and you set the threshold, you know, as some kind of a back office uh, or administrative task. So that's kind of where I was coming from. OK, so actually, so in that, in that way, I, I'm going to agree with you because you're still going to present a red, yellow or green light to the pilot as opposed to trying. Again, Absolutely. Uh, we're not trying to make turn all the pilots into meteorologists or no or. OK, no, that, that's good. Um, very, very interesting. <laughs> And and for the audience as a whole who may not know Matt Eckstein or uh, or or um, and what he does, he too is a Part 121 pilot for an airline other than United or American, which Dave was a pilot for. Uh, so uh, so he's coming at this from a similar sort of perspective. Anything else on? Uh the uh, debate uh, on probabilistic and deterministic, which always gets spirited comments. Um, and we have one other uh, one here, and I think, Bob, if you're OK, I may just let you speak to this because it's actually quite long uh, from Bob Avgen uh, at MITRE. He has uh, several comments here. And he starts off with the, the uh, next gen weather processor and CSS weather. But uh, Bob, why don't you you uh, sure see if you can capture yeah. your, uh, your your book there? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, hi, everyone, um, and a special hi to John McCarthy. Hi, John. Um, so, yeah, this uh, this is not the first time I've raised this, but I just throw it out there again: is that you know as we're progressing towards next gen weather processor and CSS weather and you know, um, this is the sort of work that we've done here at MITRE about integrating various weather products into the decision support tools. You know, the convective weather uh, avoidance products, right, that have been around and have been evolving. Um, you know, uh, potentially going to see a reroute uh, decisions made on those. And, and Rocky, you and I had a, a conversation after one of my uh, presentations about this. Um, and you said, yeah, that. That, that would make sense, especially if uh, there's a potential for basing reroute decisions on that, uh, you know, in addition to um, having your, uh, your radar products available in the cockpit, right, um, you know, beyond just the airborne, uh, you know, wind shear detection systems. And that um, to do that, you know, these, these products, you know, are generated on like, you know, 10 levels of intensities, but in terms of what's communicated, if you were going to communicate, you know, these two products, you know, uh, these products between pilots, controllers, traffic managers, dispatchers, probably 10 levels is probably too much and probably need something, you know, more along the, the four level definitions. And, you know, should those, uh, you know, be promulgated in the various orders and, uh, you know, advisory circulars so that, you know, there's common basis of what these things are you know, once they hit the uh, streets and the ass. So I think that's sort of the essence of what uh, what I was getting at. But, you know, just a response to Rocky's question about, you know, products, you know, for 
uh, you know, a display in the cockpit. Yeah, and, and, and Bob, I would agree with you. I mean, it really goes back to um, training and, and information. You know, we, we pilots need to know exactly, you know, what is the information that we're being presented and, and how is it actionable? And, uh, you know, and it has to be clear and, and unambiguous, which is why when Matt Eckstein first mentioned probabilistic forecasts, I, I was a little uncertain, but as he clarified his position, I, I absolutely agree with him. <laughs> so, um, but, but you're right that uh, some, of, some of the products that are we working on, on, on next gen weather um, are, are going to be equally valuable, um, you know, for use in different places beyond just integration into ATC decision support tools. Um, and in fact, you know, I think the the 40T trial that uh, the FAA had this summer, the, the demonstration that was, you know, just just the ability to do the uh, the trial requests and to, uh, you know, uh, get a feel for, you know. Um, is there a way to automate that, you know, the consideration of, of a, of a tr change in trajectory and, and, you know, because the clearing the hurdles, the way that it's done today with, you know, the, the process that uh, Debbie described for the TAC tool and, and all the phone calls that have to be made and all the time that has to go into that, you know, if that's the way it's done, it just can't be done, <laughs> um, you know, for every exception that an airborne aircraft wants to make it's um but if we can get to the point where some of that is automated then then there's a possibility of, of some of that happening um let's see with that i th those were the topics that i really wanted to highlight today and discuss i, I think it's been a very productive uh, information exchange um david uh, matthias or Matt, any any other comments? Or uh, I think we have a little bit of time left. But yeah, so uh, so uh, Matthias and Dave and Rocky, uh, I've been communicating with Tom Ryan on the side, who advises me that uh, that that he and his folks will be ready to go uh, as 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 soon as uh, as we say go. So um, so we can you know if 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 this. Or Point in the not too distant future is a natural break point. Uh, we can do so with confidence that they'll pick it up and and continue running. I would like to go back to something, however, that uh, if it's okay with you, Rocky, that John Kosak said, and 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 get some feedback from the the greater FPA audience. John, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start putting words in your mouth, but I'd like you to to spit them out and say them correctly when I mess it up here. But you said something like. I think this would be a good topic for FPA to work on and to and to without maybe getting into developing requirements, produce some recommendations that could then be handed off to um, an appropriate organization or organizations for further um, 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 improvement or modification or whatever the case may be. And, and let me stop there and, and ask you, John, to to put the correct words in your mouth, but I'm 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 interested in in that thought and that idea, especially since I think it's something that that, that you and Heidi and others have been uh, urging FPA to do similar things. Yeah, no, you nailed it. Um, you know, we've been talking about tiger teams and white papers and and all these other things. You know, to to finally make FPA um, not regulatory or anything crazy like that, but to make us a recognized body for um, giving legitimate recommendations to the greater every greater aviation weather community, uh, and whether that means submitting them to the FAA for uh, potential requirements uh, or to the RTCA uh, committee uh, for potential ideas on uh, requirements or my preference recommendations. Um, that sort of thing. I, I think this is that opportunity. Um, you know, the the we've got two options here. You know, we finish up today and we're done, um, or we get some people to volunteer from across the industry. You know, airlines, uh, general aviation, business aviation, 
uh, dispatch, uh, scheduling, um, our, you know, our weather friends, the FAA, uh, the research people, um, you know, put us all in a, uh, um, uh, put us all in a room and let us, you know, start beating it out. And, you know, maybe not in a room right now during COVID, but uh, virtually, uh, you know, give us the opportunity to meet more often and, and start answering some of these questions. We've asked a lot of questions today and we've, we've, we've made a couple of proposals, but what's the next step? I mean, what are we gonna do other than, you know, come back in six months or a year and say, yeah, that was a good idea, but nothing's happened. And the answer to why nothing's happened is because we haven't done anything, so. Any, any comments from the FPA um, audience with respect to um, to to what John has just said? I'm going to take silence to be assent. They all agree with you, John. Okay. That, that, that was the one the one piece I wanted to 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 circle back to Rocky if uh, b before we leave your session behind. Well, I I do think that um, you know the 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 idea of having a tiger team within FPA is is actually an an, an intriguing idea. I mean, there are, the the issue is you know there's already other committees you know with SC two hundred six for instance that's working on this issue. CDM world's working the issue a little bit. Um, the question is, would FPA, you know, sticking a, a toe in the water be productive? And I, I think the answer would probably be yes. It's, it, but it's going to be a matter of, you know, it's going to take some legwork and some, uh, you know, to, to organize it and 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 move it forward. And um, and I'm not sure. I mean, I know personally right now with my situation I don't have that the the time available to do that but I think it would be valuable if, if there is an FPA uh, if, if there are people that feel strongly that I kind of I, I mean I feel strongly that that we could use some work to mature some of the thoughts that I've talked about kind of in an, an open-ended and pro provocative way and and uh, and maybe you know circle towards what would a solution be to some of these um you know just as a suggestion um and i i would welcome anybody within fpa that wants to do with that kind of legwork dave i don't know if you've seen but tammy Flo has her hand raised yeah may i speak no, I didn't. Sorry about that. <laughs> absolutely uh, you know i i just i you know i understand where this desire is coming from but i think rocky makes a good point that we already have groups that are working this issue within RTCA and other places. And I think if FPA wants to start a tiger team or whatever you want to call it to address this issue, then there needs to be some really clear goals and it needs to come from industry. You don't need the regulators being part of this. This needs to be recommendations coming from industry. And again, you're going to have to have some really clear goals as to what your objectives are as part of this group. Don't just throw stuff out at the government and say, we want you to do this. So I mean, I'm just throwing that out as somebody who's been doing this now for <clears throat> almost 13 years and <laughs> hearing the same thing every time we have an FPA meeting. I hear the same thing. So um, and I'll just shut up now. <laughs> Well, I, I will, I, I will follow on Sammy with uh, an invitation. I mean, yeah, I think it you know it it could be productive. I think if it's well defined, as as you point out, but I I also do want to make an invitation to, you know, SC two hundred six is certainly still open um, for those that have an interest in this area that that want to work a little bit more on it, um, even even you know irrespective of of FPA involvement, um, the CDM community is kind of a little bit more closed. Uh, but there certainly is some activity in in the future concept team uh, of the CDM. Um, 
So there are places for people who have listened in today and, and want to get involved. There are ways to get involved. And I, I would second that, Rocky. Come join us in 206. <laughs> So for the uh, for the again the greater uh, FPA audience, um, I would uh, I would request or suggest perhaps that you um, th that you keep this conversation in mind um, and also um, return for tomorrow's. FPA organizational updates because um, because I, I think this will be one of the topics of discussion and and I for one would would um, would love clarity coming out of of tomorrow as opposed to as opposed to um, um, the uncertainty that I still have in my head about the best way to go forward. But I'm I'm getting the cart way a, a day plus ahead of the horse here, so um, just just keep this in mind. I think this is a really interesting discussion. However, this is John McCarthy. Can I add two bits? Absolutely, John. It's sir, is good to hear you. Nice to see, and it's nice to see you. Uh, here I am in the high mountains with smoke all around because I mm. we survived a fire up here. Uh, just going back to my own experience in Winshire, if we did not have intimate involvement with industry, we never would have gotten there. And so I think the, the comments of, uh, uh, of making sure that anything that Paul goes after has a cross cut back to industry. And I just want to second, third, whatever the motion is. Uh, it doesn't take a, a, a team of a thousand people, but you want to make sure they're represented and want to be there. Yeah. So, so Rocky, we've we've hijacked your session into a completely different area, but but clearly one that that um, that um, is related in 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 the sense of you know I think there were some intriguing um, ideas um, put forward during your session today, and now the question in my and, and other people's minds, I'm sure, is, is okay, so how do we now action, or, or what, what do we do next? And, and <laughs> it's something that, 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 that is sor sort of a, a, an FPA characteristic, is the, uh, okay, now what do we do? Yeah, and, and I, I understand that, and, uh, and again, I, I do think that, uh, you know, there are groups that are working on this, um, in RTCA and and the CDM world, but I also, if if there are entities within FPA that that value it enough, uh, I would I'd I would welcome input and and FPA involvement. Okay. Um. So Rocky, is this uh, in your mind the natural ending point of your session? I uh, yes, it is. I think, I think we've uh, you know we've gone through pretty much the issues from the airline point of view, the the dispatch pilot, and the NBA point of view, and uh, and it's you know it's a complex problem, and uh, we're not going to get a solution tomorrow, but uh, but I, hopefully everybody has a little bit more appreciation of what some of the issues are and and maybe what some of the solution paths are. That's it. So thank you, thanks, Matt. All right, Rocky. Thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell on myself now and and um, and um, let let folks know that um, that graphic of yours of the um, um, the what was it the uh, Frisco Philly flight or where, where Denver Philly I guess whatever the one I think it was Denver Philly that uh, on, in the seven three seven I remember seeing that in two thousand and seven. I think probably the first time or one of the first times that you that you unveiled it. And, and I remember sitting next to um, Bill Lieber at the time with Northwest Airlines and I was uh, representing Delta Airlines and Bill and I were kind of two like minded dispatch folks. And on the other side of the room were 
Rocky and Joe Burns, uh, and and that was a, just a, a fascinating presentation and discussion. That whole thing. So and 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 like most good ideas, which I think this is a good idea and one that we need to get our collective arms around. Uh, it's 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 at the time its biggest downfall was that it was it was too early. Maybe now is the time. However, maybe maybe the things that we need to effectively um, leverage the and lengthen the the size of the third stool leg. Maybe our time is now, and if so, we probably should get on it. Whoever we is exactly. Yep, I, I would agree with. That. Okay. Um, Tom, um, what's your pleasure? Do you want to uh, you you want to take ten and get get you guys uh, uh, lined up, and then maybe go at around one thirty or something like that. I think that sounds like a great idea, sir. Okay. Are you, uh, why don't Why don't Tom, rather than me butchering it up horribly, why don't you sort of introduce, you know, kind of what this session is about, and you know, the the, the motivation for it, which I think actually plays nicely into again some of our sort of existential FPA discussions that we've been having the last several times out. No question, Matt. Um, as uh, the last conversations were happening. That's exactly what I was thinking. This session is um, just a, uh, an attempt to keep folks aware of where various larger uh, um, opportunities are going on. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Bill Bauman uh, talking to us about the weather community of interest. He's going to bring us up to speed on where they are, and, and Bill, hopefully you'll help us see where it's headed. And by the way, Bill, if you'd like to get your uh, slides up and running, you're welcome to do so. I'm not going to put anything up. Uh, and then after Bill, Steve Dar will be giving us an update on what he's doing with ADSB. He's been doing this uh, faithfully for some time, and so it's good to uh, touch base and understand progress. And then Walter Combs, who some of you may know, Walter was at the uh, Vegas um, FPAW about a year ago, and he's going to help us understand wh what's going on with weather cams and then a, a more robust program that he's working that includes weather cams. So, Bill, if you're able to get it up and running, we could uh, we could go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Tom, and let me share my screen. <clears throat> All right, can you see my PowerPoint presentation, Tom? Yes, sir. Wow, I hardly use Teams, but I got it right the first time. How about that? <laughs> so um, thanks for asking me to, to talk about the community of interest here. And since we've got um, an extra hour I thought I'd tell a little bit of a story to get started here. And let me start out by saying that the community of interest, both the core team of folks, the five of us that are working on it, as well as all of the volunteers that we have that um, have become members of the community of interest and that are working on this is way beyond what I ever expected. And it's going extremely well. So now that I've said that, let me backtrack to 2019. Um, the idea for the community of interest started with Alfred Musikhanian, and he worked that with um, MITER, with, um, oh, what's that guy's name? Matt Franzak, I think his name is, and Dave Strand, who you all may know. And that was presented to a couple of folks in the FAA. They got a thumbs up and brought it to me. Now, remember, this is in spring of 2019 and gave their presentation to me. I was like, yeah, I don't know about this community of interest thing. Um, we in the Aviation Weather Division do a really good job working with the other FAA organizations. Um, we have routine meetings with them, including the National Weather Service. We take care of our requirements process. We do our research. Yeah, I'm not so sure about this thing. And part of what they pitched to me was PIREPS. There's a big PIREPS issue. 
Well, you know, we mostly do research in the aviation weather division. Yeah, our WIDIC program is certainly involved in PIREPS, but the division as a whole, not so much. And the other issues they showed me were kind of okay, but a lot of them we were already working. And I, I poo-pooed the idea and said, you know what? Thanks, guys, but I don't think I'm really interested. So as luck would have it, Matt was persistent, as was Alfred. And uh, throughout the rest of 2019, um, they badgered me a little bit. You know, what do you think? We, maybe we should take a second look at this. So Matt wanted to talk to me about it at the AMS meeting in 2019 or 2020. And grudgingly, I said I would do that because the end result of that was really two things. I blame Matt for giving me the flu, not COVID-19, but we met, we had dinner, we talked about it. I got sick. I got my wife sick when I got home and I got my daughter sick when I got home. The good part is Matt convinced me that we should do this. And boy, was that a good decision. Were you saying something, Matt? I thought you were going to chime in. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just thinking back to, to, to that, that, I guess it was the Hilton, right? That little, uh, that little eating area we were yep. in, <laughs> and you and I were, were, were within uh, very close proximity of one another, and that's and right. Yes, indeed, I was feeling pretty puny at that point, and you became puny, and. What a horrible thing. And by the way, I don't feel like I convinced you. I, I think you had had the aha moment earlier and you just wanted to get rid of me because you knew I was feeling. <laughs> well, whatever it took, uh, you guys worked me over a little bit. And, and boy, am I glad we, we started uh, the community of interest. And, and I'm going to tell everybody here what it's about and then the progress that we've made on it. So it, it's definitely a really cool thing. So. Thank you to Matt and to Dave and to Alfred for uh, persisting on that. And then um, Marilyn Pearson is our other core team member and I'll explain that as we get into the, the presentation here. So the first thing I wanna start off with is a video. It's about less than two minutes from our administrator, Steve Dixon. Every week he puts out a video message to the troops called Straight From Steve. and. This is one of the things that kind of secured for me the badgering that I was under that we needed to take a broader look at weather across the FAA. And not just from my perspective, from the Aviation Weather Division, but really that broad look. And w when these slides are sent out to everybody, there's a link on here for the full YouTube video if anybody wants to watch it. But this was right after AMS. This was February of 2020. And also right before we went into COVID lockdown. So kind of keep that in mind too. Um, but Steve talks about sharing data and whether information is data and breaking down silos across the FAA. Any of us that have worked in any organization of a decent size knows that within your divisions, your departments, your organizations, they don't always talk to each other. And certainly that's true in the FAA. Certainly that's true to a certain extent in weather. So let's listen to what Steve has to say about sharing data and breaking down silos. Hi everybody, Steve here. And this week I wanna to talk to you about the importance of data. You know, safety is the FAA's most important core value and big data plays an increasingly important role in improving safety. We must continue leaning into our role as a data-driven, risk-based decision-making oversight organization that prioritizes safety above all else. We do that in part by breaking down silos between organizations and implementing safety management systems supported by compliance programs and informed by data. We look at the aviation ecosystem as a whole, including how all the parts interact. When our data and our organizations are kept in silos, we may miss information that could provide an opportunity to make important safety decisions that will improve processes or even prevent accidents entirely. You know, people used to believe that the more information you had, the more power you had, or the more valuable you were. That's an old way of thinking, and times have changed. Today, the more information or data that you share, the more decisions you inform, and the more value you provide, and the more people you can help. So if we want to evolve as an agency, we need to share data. To improve safety, we need to learn from each other about data and other parts of the agency. 
the whole agency picture without silos. I'd love to hear from you on how you're working together across lines of business on data, breaking down silos, and how you're using this data to advance our very important safety goals. So, you know, Steve talked about breaking down silos and he also said, hey, send me an email. Let me know what you're doing, which from my military training, I would never email my boss's 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 boss. But luckily, <laughs> Marilyn Pearson did just that. Um, I think many of you know Marilyn. Um, while this process was going on, she had previously sent an email to Steve about UASs and weather and breaking down silos for UASs from the weather perspective across the FAA. So we had Matt badgering me, we had AMS, we had Steve give this presentation, and then Marilyn was talking to us about breaking down the silos for weather in that she had emailed Mr. Dixon and got a reply that it was a great idea. And you may remember from the previous FPAW, Steve gave the opening remarks and mentioned the weather COI was forming. So I thought about that and I went, huh, here's our silos of excellence. We've got a lot of good work going on in these different parts of the FA organization, but are we truly bringing them together from my perspective in the aviation weather division? And we weren't. So another way to look at that is the org chart of weather across the FAA. This isn't the whole FAA, but all these different organizations either research, produce, or consume weather information in some way across the FAA. And the more I thought about it, I went, holy smokes, a weather community of interest could take all these different organizations and bring them together under one umbrella. So my organization over here, NextGen, our assistant administrator, Pam Whitley, is actually the Met Authority for the United States under IKO. And you can see the weather division here in yellow. These are my branches. But we also have an aviation weather branch in another division within our own directorate. And on the left side over here, we've got safety. We've got um, uh, air traffic services, our controllers, mission support, operations, uh, the, the PMO that does acquisitions. Um, I thought we were working with all these folks together from the ANG perspective. And we were to a certain degree, but nothing like what the COI has been able to do. So the thing that really triggered it, besides Matt and Alfred talking to me and getting together and looking at the silos, was the safety report going back to 2015 on PIREPS. I'm sure a lot of you were involved in the PIREP workshop we had back during the summer and that PIREPs are still in the top five most wanted for the air traffic organization from 2015 in through 2020. And this is what really triggered the COI. There are so many different problems with PIREPs that Alfred started thinking about it. And how can we get the FAA to work together on PIREPs beyond just the workshop, beyond things like FPAW? So we started looking at the COI and what's the purpose of the COI? Well, basically, as I already said, to really look within the FAA and we'll go outside the FAA at some point and I will get to that in our relationship with FPAW. But looking at the problems, the gaps, the shortfalls, among all those different silos that are dealing with weather and figure out how we can work together. And then beyond that, looking at the scope is for us to collaborate, communicate, and really the COI is there to make sure that the different organizations are communicating with each other. We facilitate the communication. Now, I've been saying that the COI, the core members, we don't do any work. Then I looked at my time card and I'm spending about 10% of my time on the COI. We do the facilitation, but the members and subject matter experts within each FAA organization are actually doing the work and they're just getting started on that. And I'll explain how we do that as we get further into the presentation. 
So I want to backtrack a little bit. When when the idea was brought to me, I thought community of interest, you know, what in the world is that? It just looks like something we're throwing together. It's just like an extension of FPAW without any guts behind it. Well, no, it's not. It's actually a formal establishment within the FAA. The Enterprise Architecture Board establishes the communities within the FAA. So there's COIs, Community of Interest, and there's also COPs, Community of, uh, I can't remember what the P stands for. But anyway, from this authority, leadership is given to the members of the COI, specifically the core members, to identify the membership, which is our subject matter experts, to set the schedules, the meeting agendas, the priorities, and then we have to report those findings back to the Enterprise Information Group, which is made up mostly of FAA executives. And we're gonna do that in two weeks. We'll give our first presentation, um, Alfred and myself, to tell them how it's going since we started off here. Um, it's worth mentioning the governance. We do actually have a signed charter. Our executive sponsor, which is required for all COIs is Paul Fontaine. Excuse me. Uh, Paul Fontaine is my boss. He's our executive in the Portfolio Management and Technology Development Office. He's the director. The co-chairs are Alfred Musikanian and myself. Uh, David, who's been working hard at this meeting also, is our secretariat, of course, from MITRE. I mentioned Marilyn Pearson a couple of times already. Uh, she works in aviation safety and flight standards. Um, she's very focused on UAS. And she contacted Steve directly about breaking down the silos. So we're really good that Marilyn is on our core team as well. And also Matt, whose hands seem to be in everything weather and aviation, is one of our core team members as well. And I need to say at this moment, working with these four folks over the past six months or so has been an unbelievable pleasure. You know, they call it work for a reason. It's work. But doing this work with these folks has been great, and we've got a great team together and work well. And beyond that, now we've got 40 plus members of the community overall. And if my slides would advance, there we go. So this is almost another way to look at that org chart in the silos that I showed at the beginning. We needed to figure out who the members were gonna be for the COI. And we kind of started with the org chart for weather and with the silos and thought about who do we know? Who do we already work with? What line of business or staff office are they located in? And what's their role within the FAA and weather? So each one of these organizations, we have at least one representative, if not more, supporting the COI. And we approached this in two ways. One, we had Paul Fontaine send a formal memo to the directors, the executives in these organizations, requesting they formally assign members. We also contacted the members ahead of time and said, hey, by the way, your director is going to get a letter asking you to participate. So we did it from the ground up and we did it from the top down to make sure we formalized our membership. So what have we been up to? So when I was finally convinced this is a really good thing to do and move forward, in February, we started our, our preliminary discussions, which just happened to be the same time that Steve put out his silo discussion and how to break those down. We were actually meeting in person in March. That was our, our one and only, or our second and only final meeting in person before everything went virtual due to the pandemic. So we began our weekly core team meetings, which is the five of us that I previously mentioned. We drafted the charter and we talked to the other COIs within the FAA, which there was only one active at that time. And I think that's, that's true currently. So that we would not make mistakes that maybe they made. And it turns out that weather as usual is a little bit different than everybody else. So to a certain extent, we've been doing things our own way kind of flying by the seat of our pants and figuring out how to do things the way we want to do it. By April, the charter was signed. We continued having our weekly core team meetings leading up to figuring out how are we going to do the actual meetings and how are we going to do it virtually? And I think you guys could correct me if I'm wrong, Dave and, and, and Matt, 
who are discussing this. We still in April, I think we're hoping that by July, we might be able to have our first meeting at Miter's McLean facility, um, not knowing if we'd have to go completely virtual, which of course we did. So by May, we had established our membership, which really were the subject matter experts we were looking for from each organization within the FAA. As I mentioned, we solicited volunteers from folks that we already knew that were working in weather, and we got the executive sponsor, Paul Fontaine, to send a memo to the other directors to request that they assign their folks formally. By June, we were focusing on our first meeting. We worked out the logistics, we worked out the agenda, and by this time we knew there was no chance we were gonna do this in person. We were gonna have to do this virtually and really wondering how that was gonna go. Well, it went amazingly. In July, we had our first meeting and really we, the core members, kind of did all the talking to the 40 or so members from the other organizations. We explained the role of the COI in much greater detail than I've done here. And then we laid out our plans for future meetings, what we were expecting from them and where we were gonna lead this thing. In August, we solicited problem statements. So we asked each of the subject matter experts to look at what they were doing in their silo or outside of their silo with weather, whether they were researching it, consuming it, creating weather, and what problems they had. And if you've never done this before, it's not easy. So creating a problem statement has a certain amount of talent. And we devoted a couple of meetings just to going through the problem statements that were submitted. And we gave everybody a form to fill it out. And we didn't want people to come to us and say, uh, let's see, I'll pick on icing because normally I pick on turbulence. Um, our problem is, is high ice water content when flying at high altitudes near anvil clouds. And the question we would ask is, if you can say, so what? You haven't developed your problem statement yet. So what? High ice water content, what, what's that mean? That's not a problem. Oh, well, when aircraft run into that, occasionally their engines will stop. Oh, now it's getting interesting. Well, how often does that happen? Oh, I don't know, between 2000, 2009, the Australians had like 10 incidents over the ITCZ in the Pacific. Huh, not really a problem the FAA is worried about. Do you have any more data? Well, the icing experts who you heard from yesterday with the icicle program, which was fantastic, gave us what we needed and said, well, the later data shows, and a lot of this is proprietary, airlines don't seem to like to share this, up through 2018 or 19, there were dozens of incidents and they occurred over the Southern United States in addition to the South Pacific where the engines failed due to this high ice water content. Now we got a problem statement. So we worked through, I think 37 to start over a couple of meetings that took many hours to do and actually get the problem statements fine tuned. So we had the problem and we also had a very clear issue due to that problem. So once we got those developed, the next step was to, after adjudicating the, the, those problem statements, to set up what we call special weather action teams. Yes, SWATs, that was the acronym we came up with. Everybody's gotta have a good acronym. So the idea of the special weather action team is to take those problem statements and figure out how to solve the problems but not working in a vacuum. Again, the whole idea of the COI is to facilitate that cooperation across the FAA and across the organizations. So what the core team did is look at all the problem statements once we had them well-defined and try and categorize them into a SWOT. So for example, I think we had half a dozen problem statements for PIREPS. So now we have a PIREP SWOT. We had a number for icing. We had a number for UAS and so on and so forth. And I think current count is about 42 problem statements. And I think we've got 15 SWATs that we've developed. So in October, a couple of weeks ago, we started to stand up the SWATs. I think we got through six of them to discuss the logistics. We needed a lead, somebody to volunteer or have co-volunteers to lead the SWAT. And then we needed people to volunteer. You would think people that wrote problem statements that were applicable would volunteer to participate. 
and then go ahead and move out and start working on the problem statements, then you would have maybe sub swats within the larger swap. For example, Pyreps dealing with reporting or error processing or communicating or whatever the different issues were to start working on those. And then the leads of each swap will report back to the COI in subsequent meetings. And we have our next one um, in about three weeks from now. So I said earlier that we did a lot of this kind of on our own, figuring out our own way. And what I really noticed during our Zoom meetings was we typically had about 45 people that joined and through four hour, two hour meetings, most everybody hung in there till the end, even if we weren't discussing their particular problem statement. So we've got a lot of interest. This is really good. And we've got a lot of folks across the FAA that are into this. So the question is, what about working outside the FAA? What about FPAW? What about AOPA? What about National Weather Service? What about DOD? Yeah, we think we can expand outside and we'll need to do that. We do that within the Aviation Weather Division, but first we want to just get things set up within the FAA and figure out before we go beyond that. What we're looking for is other problem statements from other users of the NAS, but they need to have a government employee sponsor to get that into the COI. So we just don't want everybody and their brother coming, sending stuff to the COI with problem statements. There's a way to do that, and that's that bonus at the bottom, that QR code. If you use your smartphone to snap the QR code, that'll take you to the aviation weather request form that we have in my policy and requirements branch. We still have our formal requirements process set up within the aviation weather division to submit problem statements to the FAA. Anybody can do that. So that's one route in with problem statements. But the COI can also be that conduit. So anybody within FPAW that's got an issue that we've discussed either today or previous meetings or, or anything else that comes up, you can talk to somebody in the COI and have them submit that problem statement that will go through the same adjudication process, be added to a current SWAT or form a new SWAT and have that formally worked on by the FAA. So this is my last slide and then we can do some discussion or, or open it for questions. But going back to what I said, of course, the FAA has multiple organizations that need to interact with weather in some way. Those are the silos. Those are the different parts of the organization that research or produce or consume weather information. There's a lot of successful programs, but we don't want to duplicate effort. We want everybody to work together and make sure we're all aware of what everybody else is doing. So the COI does that by breaking down those silos, increasing the information sharing and best practices across the FAA, all the lines of business, and really leverage that weather knowledge so that the other organization knows what the other one's working on. And then eventually we'll get to interacting with external groups like FPAW and others that I mentioned. And I've got our, um, our logo up there, Marilyn Pearson designed that logo. She's got the UASs, the commercial airlines, the GA, the rockets for space weather. We've got everybody involved across the FAA that deals with weather represented in our logo and that's who we're working with. So I will leave it there and turn it back over to Mr. Ryan. I will stop sharing and see if there's any questions or comments if we have time for that. Thanks, Bill. Great, great synopsis there. Certainly, certainly hoping that your group solves some of these silos. Silo issues. Issues. Oh, I'd like, I'd like to open it uh, to anybody that has some questions for Bill. So, Bill, uh, this is Matt. Uh, I, I believe. Oh, Dave, you're still here. Sorry, Dave. Well, I, well and I tell you what, uh, I, I need to bail for a few minutes now for this other meeting. So I, I'm going to turn it over to you there. If you could on the uh, th there are a couple of comments that have come in here. So, yep. Yep. OK, so Thanks, uh, so so uh, Matthias um, comments that the weather COI appears to be focused on breaking down silos 
within the FAA. So clearly you delivered your message loudly and clearly, Bill. Uh, <laughs> he asks, how can other agencies, industry, academia, and research labs get engaged in this dialogue? And I think, unbeknownst to him, you also answered that question in the tail end of your presentation too. Correct. Yep, like I said, we're looking for, um, we, we wanna keep it to the feds to actually be the sponsor for any problem statements that we have. But certainly, you know, folks are welcome to do that. And something I thought of as I was briefing that, how do people know who's in the COI to add a problem statement? So, you know, we've got 40 or so members. And Matt, I'm not sure if we can just make that our member list available to folks in FPAW or they know who the core members are. It's me and Matt and Alfred and Marilyn and, and Dave. So that could be probably the best way to submit something to one of the five of us. We can figure out you know, where that might fit within the different lines of business and then have somebody else sponsor that. So for example, you know, if it's a, a, a PIREP issue, Alfred's been working a lot of the PIREP stuff or we could give it to the PIREP SWAT or, or something like that. UAS, we'd give it to Marilyn. She's leading the Marilyn, the, the Marilyn SWAT. <laughs> She's <laughs> leading the UAS SWAT. Sorry, Marilyn. <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied, but um, I, I think that would be a good way to do it. You folks know who we are. If nothing else, everybody knows Matt. You can get it to Matt and then he can get it to us and we'll find a federal uh, employee sponsor to, to run that through. Yeah, my, and my inbox is going to blow up and then I'm going to go, what, what do I do now? There you go. <laughs> send it to Marilyn. So Matt, you can send it to me. And there you uh, go. I don't have any questions for you, Bill, but I just want to tell everyone what a pleasure it's been to work with this group. Uh, we meet generally Wednesdays, sometimes Tuesday or Thursday, but uh, I think we all look forward to that meeting of the core group more than any other meeting all week. It just, it's, uh, it's a joy to work with this group. It's very rewarding to see how far we've come in such a short time and how enthusiastic everyone else is about the work we're doing, both internal FAA and all of you stakeholders as well. So it's just been uh, really one of the highlights of my very long career at the FAA. And the funny thing is we, we set up our meetings for an hour. We never <laughs> make it in an hour. Usually by 5 p.m. or so, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, we're still meeting and uh, laughing about stuff and having a good time to set this up. So it's been great, and but don't discount those 45 or so members that have joined the core team. Uh, like I said, they're there for every meeting. They stay on through a couple of hours or more, and they're fully engaged, which is great to see. So I was wrong in 2019. Um, this is really good. This is really good for the agency and I think for aviation weather as a whole. I agree. And I have some advice for, for those of you listening. Um, don't do as I do. Uh, I, I was uh, caught up in the emotion of the moment, uh, sending an email to my new pal, pen pal, the administrator. But uh, <laughs> I've had varying um, levels of responses to emailing directly to the administrator, in spite of him saying that he wanted to hear from us. He said that he opened it up and, and you did that. And he's been very supportive of everything weather. So that that's a good thing. It's a good connection. Matt, were there any other uh, comments submitted or questions? Yes. So Will Cromarty from Spire uh, will ask, are you working on this project with various FAA approved UAS test sites, e.g. at Grand Forks or spaceports? via FAA AST or will they be integrated later? So I can start to take a shot at that and maybe turn it over to Marilyn because she is uh, certainly so UAS focused. But one of the things that people have to realize about the COI, I, I said we don't do any work and that's the core team. And we do a lot of work, but everything that's done under the COI still has to follow the FAA procurement process, the AMS system, the, the funding lines and whatnot. So the real idea, again, is to bring everybody together to figure out what everybody's doing. Then they will go do the work and go through their standard procurement and things they have to do to get the job done. So I would say, yes, within the realm of the work that's going on in UAS, they would work at those test sites. 
um, for commercial uh, space launch. We've got a couple of folks in um, AST, our uh, commercial space organization within FAA that are part of the COI and submitted problem statements for low level and upper level wind issues. So um, it'll run the whole gamut. And Marilyn, I guess I'll turn it over to you to see if you want to add anything about the UAS perspective. I think uh, you pretty much wrapped it up uh, very well. We do have, as part of our group, uh, folks who work for AUS, and they're involved pretty heavily with what goes on in the test sites, uh, the universities, and some of the other programs like IPP and PSP. So we do have representation on the COI for almost all of the UAS programs from certification and test site work to uh, waivers and exemptions and weather and, and any other uh, form of UAS that's going on right now. Yeah, and 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 Marilyn and, and Bill, I, 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 I get the sense from Will's question that he's kind of looking to see if there's a way for, um, for direct involvement perhaps by some of these sorts of efforts. And, and I know we've spent a lot of time in our meetings talking about you know the the scope of the COI right now is is you know internal FAA with some FFRDC support from from MITRE, but that that does not preclude, and and in fact we there are precedents set by the other COI that does not preclude engagement with other federal um, uh, governmental. Non-governmental becomes very tricky because you have to start dealing with rules like, uh, you know, have we now become a federal advisory committee by bringing on these other areas, which is one of the reasons why, as far as the <clears throat> FPAW weather COI relationship, it's it, it seems like it should be very straightforward, but it's it's a little tricky and we have to be pretty careful as we as we continue down this path. But I, I certainly think there's a role for private industry in that normal procurement process and whatnot, things that come out of the COI, for example, um, of those six pirate problem statements that were submitted. One issue that may go get worked may require the support of contractors. So where something may have been more siloed before, now that it's opened up, there's a lot of other private industry that could be involved with multiple FAA organizations that would have been left out because it was siloed before and now it's opened up. So I think there's more opportunity, not only to spread the wealth across the internal FAA organization, but to all of our industry partners out there, as we work across the FAA, we'll be working across multiple industry partners as well. I don't know when we'll get there exactly. We're still crawling, I think. Well, maybe we're walking by now since we stood up our squats. Um, but again, we have yet to report to the EIG, which Alfred and I will do in about a week and a half, and see what they think of how we're doing and get their, <clears throat> excuse me, get their feedback. And then the SWATs will start reporting out to us on what they're doing. Start going down through their procurement cycles and, and, and whatnot to do the work they have to do. So we, we will get there. And, 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 and Tom, if we still have time, I'd like to uh, just um, pass along a couple of comments made by um, a a person whom I admire and respect greatly, namely uh, Dr. John McCarthy, on this topic. Uh, John comments first that this silo story is a long problem at FAA, and we could substitute any number of other large organizations for the word FAA. Yep. Uh, I could write a book on this. He, he may be actually writing that book right now. Who knows? And if this approach works, <laughs> It can do wonders, certainly uh, we respect it regarding the mix of weather and, and aviation worlds. Um, and and I, I agree with them there. And then and then uh, uh, to some later comments that I think you may have made, Bill, John comments that, uh, that, that the weather COI will need across the board leadership at FAA. And I think he means also support uh, of, of leadership at FAA and elsewhere to, to make it successful. And I think he's right about that too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's one of the reasons that the COI is required to have an executive sponsor. And that's also one of the reasons when we were looking for members to join us and our subject matter experts, not only did we recruit them from the bottom up, but it went director to director to have that senior leadership buy-in and say, yes, I am going to volunteer time of my employee to work on this with you. So John, you're, you're absolutely right. 
And in my career, I've worked in the Air Force. I've worked with NASA, National Weather Service, FAA, and oh boy, everybody's got a silo. You know, even the smaller company I worked for, there were silos because there were divisions and they're doing their own thing and they don't necessarily talk. So John, you're absolutely right. It's not just the FAA. Right. And I, I cannot emphasize how how often in, for example, the work that I did with the FAA, silos became a big problem. And then we yep. solved it by getting everybody involved. And it was a major undertaking, but very successful one. If this is in Windshear. Yeah. And, and, you know, people move around. And that's one of the problems, too, because within my own division, we've got some relatively new people that haven't been there 20 years. And when they're working on something, they go, well, I need somebody that's over in AJT. Huh. I'm not sure who to contact. Well, wait a minute. The COI knows exactly who that person is. And that's the beauty of this. We've got all the subject matter experts or the members available. So we can just raise the flag and say, hey, we're working on this over here. Who in AJ whatever knows about this? Who's our point of contact? And bam, we got them. So this is a beautiful thing. And it's really breaking those down. And I'm, I can't wait till we report up to senior leadership and hopefully to our administrator on how he helped spur us on. And Marilyn did with, with her, her email to him. And we're really breaking down these silos for weather. It's very exciting. Great. Thanks, John. All right, Tom, that's all I got. Back to you, sir. That's great. Bill, thanks a ton. Uh, sure. Much success to you, sir. Much success. All right. Next is uh, Steve Dar. Steve, you up and around? Yeah, I'm here. I'll, um, start Coming in here. very low, Steve. Can't hardly hear you. Let me know if this is a bit better. That's a bit better. And we do see your slides. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bill. Hopefully you see some things here that uh, that help some of your SWAT uh, efforts within the community of interest. Um, I know that, uh, and I appreciate that, that you indicated strong support for this development out of the next gen weather division. Um, and uh, and I think that that's uh, that support and, and maybe expanded by the COI uh, is going to be necessary moving forward to uh, to really get the benefit of this uh, this new development. But I'm going to talk about <clears throat> um, the FAA's new. Uh, surveillance system for aircraft automatic dependent surveillance broadcast uh, earlier this year um, a rule went into effect that required airplanes to know where they are and to report that a uh, couple of times a second whenever they're operating both on the ground and in flight uh, to the uh, adsb ground system which uh, then puts that information on controllers displays. Uh, that uh, that effort uh, started a long time ago and was uh, the, the rule was proposed and, and put in place um, uh, in terms of, of compliance um, on uh, the first of this year, but um, but had been building from um, an ADSB standard that was published a decade ago. Uh, and uh, for the last four years, we've been working to update that standard. And um, I'm going to give you the uh, the status update on that. Um, and uh, a little bit of background first. Um, I think we all know that using aircraft as weather observation platforms has a long history that started with uh, pilot reporting. Uh, it's continued into an automated aircraft report uh, structure that uh, that has buy-in at ICAO um, and uh, is part of the ICAO requirements. Uh, the, uh, the ADSB weather uh, concept or, or, or capability is now specified in the um, the upcoming ADSB version three. So the the rule I talked about is. Uh, predicated on version two as a standard. Um, version three will be published later this year and ADSB weather is specified as an optional feature 
in that new version, and it has two components. It's got an air rep component, which uh, provides fully automated uh, uh, routine broadcast of, of meteorological and other data that is either sensed directly or derived uh, onboard aircraft. <clears throat> and then it's got a PIREP uh, component as well that enables the broadcast of pilot observed weather data. Uh, and, uh, and the ADSB ground receiver network that is currently operating and supporting uh, position surveillance for, uh, for air traffic management and control um, is planning, you know, has, there are plans in place to update that network to receive version three messages to include the, uh, the ADSB weather messages. Uh, and while there is not a, a mandate planned for uh, requiring aircraft to uh, equip with version three avionics, uh, when the technical standards order or TSO gets published uh, next year that uh, invokes the version three standard, there will be a, a date specified after which manufacturers building new ADSB avionics um, for certification uh, will have to comply with the version three standard as opposed to the version two standard. And so there will be a, an evolution uh, through which version three avionics uh, will be uh, will become you know part of the system. Uh, jumping right into what uh, is included in an air rep um, in the air rep portion of this, the the future ADSB devices which <clears throat> support the air rep capability uh, will be capable of of providing four different messages. Uh, and, uh, and those are shown at the bottom here with the parameters that are associated with them. If, uh, if you're air rep capable, um, every 2.2 seconds you'll broadcast a weather state message or an alternate weather state message. And that uh, decision as to which goes out will be dependent on whether or not the wind information is valid at the time it's ready to go. Uh, and so you'll have icing status, uh, which will be um, provided by automated systems like in-flight ice detection systems. You'll have a wind quality indicator, which is based on a roll angle and a couple of other things that the transponder um, has as inputs. Um, you have a wind speed and a wind direction, an air temperature and an air speed. Uh, and if if the wind, for whatever reason, is not valid when the message is ready to go out, uh, instead an alternate weather state message will be sent, which includes icing status and roll angle and heading in place of wind and wind quality indicator and then air temperature and airspeed as well. Um, for for uh, transponders, mode S transponders, which are not uh, which do not include the, the air wrap capability, um, but are um, provided with the European enhanced surveillance capability, uh, they'll always send the alternate weather state message even if they're not air wrap capable. And that'll include, um, if, they, if they implement icing, it'll include icing status. If they don't implement icing, it'll include the four parameters you see below that in the alternate weather state message, the roll angle, heading, air temperature, and air speed. Um, and then um, the, uh, there are two other messages that go out with weather data in them. An existing message, the emergency priority status and mode A code message. Uh, there were some empty, um, empty bits in it, and we put uh, eddy dissipation rate into there along with water vapor. Uh, so you'll get a, a mean eddy dissipation rate, uh, which will be a one minute average uh, uh, turbulence measure, a peak. Um, measure within that one minute, a uh, measure of where in that one minute it occurred in terms of the EDR offset, and then for uh, for aircraft which are equipped with um, with water vapor um, sensing capability, they get a water vapor measurement. <clears throat> uh, there's a, a third message um, that'll come out called the aircraft state message, and it provides information for various applications that need 
information about the aircraft to make sense of what some of what they're getting um, from a weather perspective and um, aircraft configuration which is a slat and and flap and landing gear position uh, metric will be broadcast along with the aircraft type which will be the ICAO uh, type designator the gross weight which will either be the current gross weight or the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft depending on what the aircraft is capable of reporting uh, and the wingspan and a uh, number of those parameters for those uh, of the group that are familiar with wake turbulence calculations are needed to do uh, wake turbulence strength uh, calculations. On the PIREP side of things, um, <clears throat> there are three messages that transmit uh, data that's required to uh, correlate the observations in space and time and encode what we think of as PIREPs using ground-based processing. So you see a whole bunch of different parameters here uh, from which um, a PIREP can be encoded uh, into the, the format that was discussed yesterday when, uh, when Gordy was talking about breaking action. Uh, the, uh, the air to air reception of PIREP messages doesn't really do any good, so there, isn't, there aren't any uh, requirements associated with that uh, because the way in which the correlation of space and, and space and time is provided is based on the PIREP time parameter, the, the first one you see in the first message on the left. Uh, and it's a relative measure. Uh, and the ground-based processing will look at the aircraft's track and that relative measure of time and find out where the airplane was when the, uh, when the fire up was submitted uh, or where the aircraft was when, when the pilot says the weather was observed. So either, uh, either are possible. Uh, but to, to Gordy's uh, question about being able to to uh, include breaking action in PIREPs. Uh, we have that capability. If you look over at the, the right column, fourth uh, parameter down is breaking action. And when that's correlated with uh, the runway number and position, uh, you'll be able to receive breaking action reports that can be made, you know, not while the pilot, pilot is, is uh, taxiing in, but after the pilot gets to the, to the gate and is uh, going through the shutdown, it will be able to, um, to submit a breaking action report if, if they desire. <clears throat> so th there's a lot of different fields here, the combinations of which provide uh, the information associated with things like uh, turbulence uh, levels or cloud levels, um, weather um, in flight up to three different um, Flight weather parameters, um, which is the maximum number that can be broadcast in a an encoded PIREP. So there was a lot of work done to look at um, at what uh, is able to be put into PIREPs today, and to ensure that all the different phenomena um, can be included. The only thing that is not available is uh, freeform text comments. Uh, the, the data link simply doesn't uh, support it. But all the things that normally get put into the remarks section of a PIREP um, can be um, can be derived from this in terms of phenomenon like uh, volcanic ash or or a tornadic activity, those sorts of things, breaking action, wind shear, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of different applications we were working to support in developing ADSB weather. Um, you'll see uh, that they break down broadly into three different areas: air traffic wake turbulence and weather forecasting. Uh, somebody mentioned something about uh, having forecasts that update more rapidly and are, are better, uh, uh, you know, more more accurate. And um, and you'll see that that, you know, if we get data out of the aircraft um, that are operating in and out of the terminal areas for which forecasts are produced and for which, you know, her provides uh, updates Right now, I think her runs at, at 15 minutes, um, but running it without new initialization data doesn't change the results. Uh, if we're getting measures of wind and temperature and, and the other parameters you saw in the air rep messages, uh, every few seconds as aircraft uh, transit the airspace, uh, you can see that the initialization data to allow uh, more frequent running of the models 
uh, will be available. It's it's not available today, but it will be available in the future. So uh, there are some implications associated with having put it into the standard as optional, um, and um, and that is that <clears throat> the manufacturers that build these avionics will be able to choose whether or not to offer the features. So um, so you only get um, the air rep messages implemented by manufacturers that choose to offer the air rep feature and um, and pirate messages from manufacturers choosing to offer the pirate feature. Uh, another aspect of of the, the standard itself is that it only applies to the ADSB boxes, so the avionics box, and, and therefore there are no uh, <clears throat> there are no requirements associated with what gets fed to the box. So the air up messages have requirements, but the input side of things only has recommendations in the mods. And and there are um, there is work underway to define interfaces for those parameters and, and to define how those parameters are derived, but there's continuing work needed there. Uh, similarly, on the PIREP side, um, there's no expectation that PIREP data would be directly entered into your transponder or your ADSB device, <clears throat> and so there's no uh, interface specified in the MOPS, uh, but an external interface is anticipated for that, and that's something that we'll be working with uh, uh, EFB manufacturers and, and, AV and ADSB manufacturers to connect that, um, that interface so that uh, PIREPs can be submitted and, uh, and transmitted. So how do we get the signal in space? We've got the MOPS in the upper left. We've got it's a consensus standard. It's already been approved for uh, submission to the RTCA's leadership and the uh, EuroK's leadership for uh, publication. Uh, it'll result in um, public you know, publication later this year by both uh, both groups um, in the December timeframe is when those decisions will be made. Uh, within the, the next year, avionics regulations will come out, the technical standards orders I referred to that will uh, identify the performance requirements for the boxes on board the aircraft. Then there will be uh, <clears throat> manufacturers that build those things and apply for certification to install them in, in various aircraft. Uh, that's a supplemental type certificate for the aircraft itself. And then uh, operating regulations can uh, can uh, be implemented for things like the ADSB rule itself, where it says if you're flying in certain airspace, you need to have uh, certain capabilities. Um, we don't see uh, currently any change to the ADSB rule that would require weather uh, as a as an output, but that's something that um, that's still open open to discussion and influence uh, when regulators invoke the. Version three MOPS, they could specify those capabilities as required functions, even though they're they're specified as as um, optional in the in the consensus standards. And that's um, that's actually how enhanced surveillance and elementary surveillance uh, is uh, is specified in Europe. The uh, the mode S transponder uh, standards um, list in the enhanced surveillance as as optional. And uh, European rules require that if you're flying in their airspace, you be capable of, of providing enhanced surveillance depending on the type of aircraft you are. So, um, so we do have precedent for those sorts of uh, requirements. But ultimately, what our interest is in developing ADSB weather has been that, that we enable ADSB weather on the basis of standards, regulations, and the interests of operators. So, we want to give operators the ability to. Uh, to equip with and then connect the uh, information that's on board the aircraft so that it can be sent off board the aircraft. And that would uh, that would result in in the ability to receive that information both air to air and air to ground and do the sorts of things um, that uh, that are the supported applications that we saw a couple of charts ago. So uh, we're trying to answer the questions about um, Implementation should air rep and or PIREP be required by TSO? Should it be mandated for entry into ADSB airspace? 
And if so, um, should it be just for things that are already available on the aircraft from installed systems such as um, air pressure, temperature, and wind? Or should it, uh, should it require uh, also equipping with specialized uh, systems like EDR and water vapor systems? Uh, and we think we know where most of the folks um, stand on, on a variety of these questions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Next Gen Weather Office wanted this to be a requirement within the MOPS. We didn't, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to make that happen. But if uh, if there's real interest in that, there's still an opportunity to talk to aircraft certification about making a requirement in the TSO, and then um, uh, you know what what should be implemented um, if that's the case in terms of uh, entry into ADSB airspace is uh, something we can continue talking about and working toward. So as I mentioned, we're, we're looking to uh, the publication of the, the new standard in December of this year, uh, looking at manufacturers plans and aircraft cert plans for the TSO. We think it's possible that uh, we could have version three messages available uh, from avionics in 2022. Um, as I mentioned, the, the ground receipt and distribution planning for ADSB weather is ongoing, um, and we're coordinating to ensure that we maximize those benefits. Um, and beyond that, um, there are the to look at their own systems to plan and implement the data once it's uh, received and disseminated. And um, the Aviation Weather Center is aware of this activity and, and working, uh, you know, coordinating with us on both AIREP and PIREP. And, and um, there are some preliminary thoughts there, but many answers to be uh, to be arrived at still. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, this development effort. Um, and we're going to continue coordinating with the weather community and, and others, uh, other standards bodies. We're uh, coordinating this with ICAO. Um, both at the surveillance uh, panel and, and MET panel uh, and with manufacturers and operators. And as, um, as the U.S. Uh, continues to have a dual link solution for uh, ADSB, where there's a universal access uh, transceiver or a 1090 uh, MODES transponder that can be used to send uh, ADSB messages, we'll be um, working to harmonize that um, the two of them, uh, the, the publication of this of the standard that I've mentioned is the 1090 standard um, that's coming in December and within the next year uh, we should have uh, the universal access transceiver standard harmonized with that. So uh, here's my contact information and the, uh, the names of the groups that I've been working this uh, this issue with and and subject to your questions. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any of those that people have. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this is Matt. And um, from uh, Will Cromarty, uh, the question is, where do you see the space-based ADSB weather, e.g. pilots transiting remote or oceanic region regions? So uh, space based ADSB is is functioning today. Um, the uh, and, and is being used for separation purposes by uh, regulators and, and uh, I guess not regulators, ANSPs, Aviation Navigation Service Providers, other than the United States. Uh, Canada uses it uh, to great success uh, throughout much of the uh, the entry and exit areas from the North Atlantic track system and throughout uh, their more remote areas um, in uh, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan and such. Um, the US has done some uh, some work in the Caribbean looking at the potential to use uh, space based ADSB to uh, fill in gaps associated with uh, uh, radar uh, areas that don't currently have radar coverage or areas where uh, radar coverage is spotty, um, and uh, that's an ongoing evaluation there. Um, the work we've done to coordinate with I to coordinate ADSB weather with ICAO has given uh, you know insight into uh, into the space-based ADSB, and 
um, and the the manufacturer, the, the operator of the space-based ADSB uh, system is a participant in the standard setting process, and we're told that they will be able to receive version three messages as well. So for any um, for any National Weather Service uh, or uh, aviation um, uh, service provider that wanted to uh, make that part of the feed, it looks like Arion, um, the, the operator of that system would be able to uh, deliver not just the position uh, data, but also the weather data coming off the aircraft. Very good. Thank you, Steve. And uh, Tara Ladwig from NOAA Ezreal comments, um, foot stomps something you said, Steve. She says, from the weather modeling perspective, ADSB weather observations will be extremely helpful for model initialization. And we look forward, my words now, jealously to getting this type of, of data in. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. We're, uh, we're going to continue working on it. And and I think it could be a real game changer, not just for aviation weather, but weather in general. Yep. And uh, then uh, I, I had uh, put a comment in. I, I saw, I, I noted on one of your slides, um, a I think it was the second to last slide, um, uh, a, a statement about uh, uh, air rep or uh, alternatively aircraft based observation message handling and dissemination and in, in my view that's 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 key to the kingdom here is being able to get this information into the hands of the broader mass user um, modeler researcher uh, community uh, you know we can we can have great we can establish great flows down to the ground but we don't figure out how to get the information in the hands of the people who need it to make decisions or to to inform um, forecast models, then then we've only got a a partial solution, and and uh, and and I know you all are thinking about that too uh, in the work you're doing. We are, and I think uh, uh, Bill Bauman's uh, you know being able to talk to the community of interest, the 47 uh, entities within FAA that that you know produce, use, or or are influenced by weather um, is. Uh, something that you know um, i think we'd want to do some direct coordination with uh or through the community of interest to ensure that um that dissemination piece uh, is fully informed by that group yeah i'm sure steve you have the the interest of uh, gary picodner um gary's doing a lot of work through Wittick with the adsb and gary and uh, eldridge and and of course randy bass runs that branch so we certainly have interest within the division i'm sure that can be extended to the coi yes and and we're actually um i'm now in part working for um that group uh, because they've uh, provided some funding to develop the pyrep aspect of this right yep that means steve that you too are working for bill bauman as is seemingly three-quarter of the people on this call Indirectly, yep. i wouldn't go quite that far <laughs> and the rest of us wish we worked for him <laughs> um steve uh, rob banks uh formerly of delta now working at pemdis did I say that right, Rob? Is it PEMDAS or PEMDIS? No audio. Sorry, uh, man, I, had, I, I had to tap my mute button a few times. Uh, yeah, PEMDAS. You got PEMDAS. It. Cool. Uh, Rob asks, will this data be planned to go on MADIS or other public feeds? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, we spoke with MADIS. Uh, couple of years ago and and um, or, or with the NOAA folks that that um, are responsible for MADIS and, and uh, let them know just how much data was going to be coming and whether or not their systems might be able to accept it. Um, but the, the sort of default model um, is that this would go to MADIS and um, uh, and be publicly available, you know, for use from now casting to climatology. 
research. And um, <clears throat> we did also, uh, I should let people know, we, we spoke with A4A uh, with their um, operations and weather uh, uh, committees a, f a few years ago um, to ask uh, about data sharing uh, concerns because there were uh, people that anecdotally said that this wouldn't you know or couldn't happen because nobody would share the data and um, we got back from a4a that there were no objections uh, raised in those committees um, and uh, similarly um, when we started working with ICAO IATA that's uh, which is represented and is the international um, extension or, or the international uh, parent to a4a um, had some uh, questions along the same lines and they went out to all of their regional groups and uh, coordinated within their uh, their regional uh, representation and uh, brought back that uh, that their um, their membership supported this as an activity and a capability and uh, and that there were no uh, concerns about how we were um, proposing this for implementation and that goes back to that graphical chart where it shows that we you know we have standards we have regulations and we have operator interests all uh, tied in in um, being able to uh, implement this capability and matt you muted yourself and your mouth is moving and i can't hear you if I don't do that 43 times a week, I have not had a good week. Thank you, Steve, for for your your uh, as always excellent and 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 very technical briefing and um, and for all the hard work you do to aiming toward uh, this particular windmill that you're tilting at. Uh, uh, we we all do appreciate it, and like Tara, I think are all collectively looking forward to seeing when uh, when the 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 spigot is opened up a little bit and there's some some good stuff coming out the other end. Tom Ryan, back over to you, sir. Thank you, Matt. Well said and fully agree. Steve, you're just doing a yeoman's work here and we're grateful that you're regularly updating us. Thank you, sir. All right, so next in our little session here, we're gonna be talking to uh, Walter Combs. Uh, Walter is an Alaska boy and he's got some exceptionally good work that he's gonna talk to us about. Walter, you on? Can you show your slides? No, I'm on and I'm showing my slides. Can you see we me? We see them and we hear you. Thank you, sir. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, Tom asked me to join again this year to uh, to give everybody a rundown on what the program is and and where we at where we are with the projects that we're working. Uh, I will say that about a year ago we were pulled over into AJR SysOps uh, under Flight Services. We've been working with flight services, or I have, in, in leading the program since uh, 2007. And flight service has been a huge part of the development of the weather camera program. And some of the ideas that we've got to improve aviation and safety and efficiency for pilots, not just in Alaska, but as we expand into the lower 48 and Hawaii uh, to those operators as well. So our mission is safety and efficiency. That's what we do. That's what we target. And we're always chasing those two, uh, those two goals for the, for, for the agency. The way we do it, of course, is uh, uh, we're providing it with, with camera images and with other weather data, as well as our website, where we're pulling all, all aspects of, of weather aviation data onto one portal, if you will, uh, to try to help pilots that, uh, especially the low flyers, the 91s and 135s and and and, uh, and that nature. But, you know, uh, the, the 121s are using our service as well. I know for a fact that, that uh, Alaska Airlines and Delta uh, both use our system, our, our images on their EFBs, and Lufthansa of all the places, you wouldn't think uh, maybe they would be wanting to use the the camera images, but but the but the one twenty ones are using it for more for an efficiency perspective. Should we fly over or should we try to land and fuel up in Anchorage? I think that's really kind of the the essence. But uh, one of the Delta pilots told me that before he leaves Seattle, 
he checks the weather camera images up all the way up to Juno before he leaves and while he's in flight uh, through his EFB. So I was pretty happy to hear that, to know that we're hitting uh, pretty much all of the operators or all, all of the different aspects of aviation are, are enjoying the the outputs and, and the data that we're providing. So it's always good to go back and, and, and remember our roots. How did we get here? How did we get started and why did we start? Pilots used to fly out and take a look and I'll show you that in just a moment. But now you can look before you fly. <clears throat> This here is a, an image from Hyder, Alaska. And as you can see on the right is the clear day image, to the left is the current image. Should I try to fly through there or not? I need to get into the airport, which is just behind us, uh, behind this, this camera image or this direction. And uh, June, or excuse me, Ketchikan is out through that valley that you can see right there, that canyon. And before you ever leave Ketchikan, you ask yourself, should I leave? Uh, and uh, with the camera images, they're within 10 minutes old. You can tell whether or not you really should leave yet or not. <clears throat> of course, we have the weather cameras, the website that I told you about. It's new. There's a new URL out there and a whole new uh, weather camera website. Uh, it's weathercams.faa.gov. Of course, the AVCAMS website is still available, but uh, this new site brings in a lot of new data. And what's really nice about this is you can bring now, you can bring up satellite imagery and radar imagery overlaying uh, both, bo both graphics overlay over the map. And you're able to actually see what, you know, what that looks like uh, in the areas and where you're flying. I guess uh, it stands to mention that I, uh, one more time that Virtually everybody's using our images. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention is that uh, even though we're pulled over into AJR, uh, I still work for Bill Bauman and Randy Bass kind of secretly working with some of the research and development programs that are going on over there. Uh, it's it's great to work with with the Wittick program and with with uh, Jenny Calavito's program with the VIA. Uh, there's a uh, uh, presentation and and some presentations on that program where we're working right now as well. So you'll see more information on that VIA program, which is visibility estimates through image analysis. And uh, we, we lovingly call it edge detection, uh, where it, it extrapolates from images distances for, for uh, visibility and for ceiling. And we can also use that new algorithm or that new data output to validate the camera image. So our cameras are pointed in one direction. It's, we call it a static image. So it should always maintain its position uh, so that it matches the clear day image and, and we don't create confusion there. Right now I have a, a, a person that logs in every day and looks at every camera to make sure that those cameras are sitting uh, in, their, in their static position. Uh, the new VIA program, we're already using it under test and development to identify cameras that fall off of their axis or, or somehow moved off of their axis and it gives us a flag. So already we're seeing the benefits of it from our remote monitoring uh, program uh, within, within uh, weather cameras. Of course, NOAA, National Weather Service, uh, and uh, the marine industry is, is also enjoying the benefits of the cameras. <clears throat> How do they use the cameras? Well, all along the route. If you're leaving Anchorage up there in the left upper left corner, you can view camera images all along your route to Cordova in those areas that we call pinch points. Those are the areas that we know, uh, we know that weather can impact flights, uh, basically. So the that site right there, those two just just to the right of uh, Anchorage, then is the um, is the Whittier Pass, and it's a mountain pass, and we got cameras on each side. So pilots used to have to fly out, fly all the way down Turnigan Arm into the pass, and see if they can make it through that pass. Turn around and go back to Anchorage. They might do that four or five times before they're actually able to make it through. If they do push through and get into Prince William Sound, 
it's a 50 50 chance before cameras that you might find good weather in there uh, otherwise now you're trapped in prince william sound you've made it through the pass but you're trapped in the and the clouds are clear to the water pretty common now pilots can take a look and and get in the aircraft and take off when they when they think it's re they're able to fly when the weather's good enough and here's something that i think everybody should put in their pocket is while in flight even though we don't have weather in the cockpit we do have a radio we can radio back to flight service and get a weather update or a weather briefing update on the weather cameras to to ask them you know what does it look like can we make it through the pass and they can give you a briefing on those weather cameras. We know through the flight service organization that over 70% of the calls into flight service in Alaska are pilots looking for weather information from weather cameras. They, they call and they specifically ask, what do the weather cameras look like at Whittier Pass? So what does our system look like? Our system is modularized. We built this so that you can install it anywhere. Uh, if if it doesn't, if something doesn't exist, like one of the one of the, the there's there's three big ones: space, power, and comms. If uh, space, power, or comm doesn't exist, we build our own, and this modular aspect of the program allows us to quickly install and quickly maintain. We have a 30-minute maintenance philosophy when you hit the ground you can repair anything on the site within 30 minutes and be gone to the next site so uh, low cost high availability it's it's a great uh, system a great network a great architecture and we're quite proud of it cameras we have a, a weather head right now at, at many of our sites and let's keep let's let's keep that in mind as i'm as i move on but that little weather head right now provides winds, temperature, humidity, and humidity and rainfall for us. Uh, it's a, it's a low cost, low tech piece of equipment, but it does not provide pressure, doesn't provide visibility or ceiling, and we're going we're working to change that. Uh, the camera control unit allows us all of our remote monitoring and remote controls. We know that about 40% of all outages we can actually restore remotely from from the desk in Anchorage. Our IP telecommunication system, if there's not comms, we can now with with six different uh, methods of of IP telecommunications or or uh, yeah methods, uh, cellular, VSAT, radio link, that nature thing, we can provide comms at any location. We've proven it in Alaska and we're gonna prove it in Hawaii here coming soon. We have a cloud network now. We're just opening it up. We're going to make APIs available for pilots or excuse me for other organizations to access our images and place them on our on our cloud net or excuse me place them on their applications. Forflight is uh, one of the big ones we're working with right now uh, to to develop a um, a user agreement and and a method in which we can share those images at the least cost to our system and to our uh, to our operations and, and to our costs. Of course, uh, all the images go to our new website. Uh, uh, it's and, and, and the old websites, you can see them there. Uh, I brought up the new website earlier, but I wanted to make sure that I had these other two. Those are still available, but we'll soon sunset those. Here's an example of being able to install anywhere. It's modular um, up there in the left hand corner. Uh, you can see that we didn't have space power or com, so we built our own. That's a that Nyack is a, a place where the mining company there took their bulldozer out there and and leveled a spot, and we installed our camera system. It's solar and wind powered, battery plant, telecommunications. It's high tech, and we're it, it is not only is it high tech, but it's high availability. So we have a very robust remote powered system. And then all the others have some form of, of uh, space power and comm that we had to, space power or comms that we had to provide. Sometimes we have to get fancy. Uh, we got real fancy at these locations and there's quite a, quite a number of others. The, the, that Misty Fjord site right there, we weren't able to install above the high water line because uh, it's a national monument and there's two the, the environmental regulations really limited 
actually restricted and 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 forbid uh, an installation above high water line. So I found out that the state owned everything under the high water line. So we we built uh, we built on on a rock there, and uh, it's basically a small dock that's been there now since 2009. And uh, it still operates year round, so we're we're quite proud of that. And it's very, very, as you can tell, it's in the ocean there. So you got tidal influence, and you got wave influence, and logs that come up and bash against the sides, and that kind of thing. So uh, it it's built well, and it's served us well. All right, so let's get to the real stuff. <clears throat> Weather cameras really does provide. Uh, improved safety and efficiency and these algorithms excuse me this uh, this performance metrics was established by the MITRE Corporation who done a fantastic job with the whole program helping us get it set up identify the right locations for camera sites and and uh, identifying a performance uh, target each year so that we could measure whether or not weather cams really was worth the investment. So as, as you can see, I won't go through the whole thing for you, but you can see up there, we have a baseline for the for the accident rate of 0.28 per 100,000 hours of operations. The first year we were, we targeted 0.24 and our actual was 0.21. And as you can see, every year there was a target, there was an actual performance. And in the end, we have an 85% reduction in weather related aviation accidents, 69% reduction in turnarounds. That's where a pilot flies out to see if he can make it or not, and he comes back home because he couldn't make it. So the NTSB recognized the, the, the benefits of the system. Now yeah, they're mostly interested in, in safety and I don't, I've never seen uh, any of the NTSB folks rave about the efficiencies that, we're, that our system provides, but definitely the safety perspective. They, they done a study in 2012 and 13 and in, I believe it was August of 2013, they submit, they, they, um, uh, submitted uh, safety recommendations to the agency to install cameras in Hawaii, cameras in the CONUS, and to teach weather, excuse me, to teach flight service specialists in the lower 48 states in Hawaii how to brief those images like they do in Alaska. <clears throat> in April of, uh, of 2009, uh, 2020, <laughs> Uh, I got finally got a, a JRC, our Joint Resources Council, approval to install cameras in uh, Hawaii and the and the CONUS. Our first shot was getting cameras over at Colorado. Uh, the Colorado Aviation Division contacted me, and we made an agreement that uh, they would uh, they would fund these cameras uh, basically through a through a, re a cost reimbursable. They'll fund the cameras. Uh, my team will go down and install them, so they don't have to. Uh, use, what we were trying to do was eliminate the higher costs of reinventing the wheels. So we took our system down. We shared our technology with them, helped them install them on a cost reimbursable. And as you as was briefed earlier today, there's 13 sites in Colorado, and I can safely say now. Uh, that camp that Colorado is now wanting to do about 10 more. Uh, they've got some funding that I think we can do about 10 sites next starting next spring. So we may soon have as many camera sites in Colorado as, as we're going to have in Hawaii as well. So in Hawaii, we're going to put we have funds and and uh, uh, and and processes in place approvals to install 23 si systems in in Hawaii. We're going to do we're actually starting the engineering surveys uh, next month on the 15th of November. We're going to hit the hit the streets in, in Hawaii and start doing all of our surveys and preparing to install over the winter months at least 10 sites. Uh, and by the end of 2022, we'll have 23 sites in Hawaii. The Hawaii operators, especially the tour operators and helicopter organizations are really pleased that, that we're finally going to make it. They've been after us for well since 2007 that I can remember at least 2007 they've wanted cameras as well and and there's been a huge need for cameras there so I'm quite pleased that we're able to actually um, 
actually help them with 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 getting cameras in and, and helping improve their operations there. Future years, uh, we're going to go back to the CONUS and we're going to look, you know, we're going to take a, a, a good solid look at all those mountain passes at airports. We're offering the same partnership that we have with the state of Colorado to all other state DOTs. If the state DOTs, airports, or municipalities in any state wants to work with us to install cameras, uh, I'm I'm here. They've spread my my contact information to them, and uh, I'm happy to help them with that and get them installed. We're working with Montana right now, so it looks to me like Montana is going to be the next state to to take advantage of this opportunity for us to help them install good, solid, robust camera systems so that they can maintain them. And our and in the partnership is. My side of the partnership is sharing our technology, providing engineering support when they need it for their maintenance and, and, and upkeep, and sharing their images on our website so all, all uh, entities have immediate access on a single portal to get those images. <clears throat> we started with the Mountain AWAS sites in Colorado, so we've done the 13 sites there. I've already described the cost reimbursable and uh, our adi the additional installs that we have planned starting spring of next year. Yep, the, the Hawaii camera installations in 2014, I traveled there right after we had received uh, the recommendations. I traveled to Hawaii and flew around all the islands with the different operators. It was a different operator on each one of the islands, the, those who the, their primary business was on there. Uh, I interviewed them. I picked their brain. I've I found these cam these these service areas where they need service. Now those pins in that on that map aren't pins where cameras are going. Those are pins where camera service needs to be established. So that's an area, a 20 mile circumference uh, area. Uh, generally, we pick that needs weather. Now we may end up having to put two camera systems in there to serve an area or a service area, but that those are the 23 service areas that we've got for Hawaii that we have identified. And I think we have real good coverage there. I haven't, we are working with the industry right now to identify any other service areas that we may have missed. And so that is ongoing. So as we do our sur engineering surveys, that information is going to be pulled out from each one of the operators, and we will assess that and determine whether or not we do need to add another service area uh, for, for camera service. So here's where I would told you to hang on to the idea about that weather sensor that we've got on our camera systems. We didn't have a system that provides, I mean, this system that we currently have doesn't provide ceiling visibility or pressure. And the reason we don't provide that information is because I don't have a surety level or a level of confidence in those in, in system, or excuse me, in, in those data products that I might be able to pull and provide to the public. The others I'm, we were relatively sure of uh, it does operate under the advisory category, so it's not, you can't make a primary flight decision on it, but you can look at it and you can look, look at the images and that wind information uh, to get a better idea of what is going on at the site. One of the things I always said is if you take a METAR and you take a camera image and you put those two together, you now have what we call the whole picture. You know what's going on at that site. You know what your conditions are, at least to to the extent possible. That's what I want to do. I want to try. How are we going to increase this this value of this weather station that we have right now? It's just images with a real low value weather head. How do I increase our our service? Um, Parallel to that, and that thought of mine, Flight Standards has approached me, and Gordy Rother is is uh, on here today, of course, as you know, and I'm going to ask him to jump in and add more of his inputs on this system. But Gordy and his team uh, got in contact with me and with the new HR 302, Section 322, and 516 uh, uh, legislation that was pushed through the authorization bill of uh, 2018. 
they came to me and said, we've got to do something. Right now we have pilots that are going to have the authorization to use any weather out there that's not a METAR if a METAR doesn't exist. So I, together we come up with this concept to develop a platform that provides visibility and an observation platform together. So this new VWAS, we call it, it's called a Visual Weather Observation System. It combines the 360-degree camera system that, that we in the program have, I'll say, invented, but we've built it ourselves uh, in conjunction with a, with a manufacturer that we currently work with. And we have a system now that that uh, is is all it's it's ready to go prime time we believe, uh, but we are testing right now. We've developed the rest of the the weather station, which is all of the components on this weather station are components that are currently uh, on an AWAS. So we're using all viceless sensors that that typically you will find on an AWAS, and we're testing this to be. Uh, uh, to to provide pilots this secondary or this lower standard of weather. So what we're looking for is a confidence factor. Right now we have what we call what, we, what we've been lovingly call the gold standard. That is a METAR. It's the gold standard, right? And and it's certified weather. We can trust that weather, and we know it. And we have we have a lot of confidence in that system. But then there's all the rest of that weather. Right, advisory is just all the rest of that weather. It could be, it could be a MOS, which, which is a very high value system made by National Weather Service that is, is now uh, basically out of production. They have quit installing those systems, and there's only a few that actually operate. But those are high value systems. And then we've got the Costco weather station that's plugged into to underground weather under, and and it's installed under my friends carport up on the hillside in Anchorage. Uh, he, the only reason he installed that was so he could see whether or not it was cold enough that he needed to remote start his car before he went out to, to drive to work. But that weather is being provided to underground weather and it's available to anybody that wants to grab it and try to use it for, let's say, an aviation decision. So we're looking for how do we build the silver standard? How do we build a system and how do we de design a, a, a specification that, that manufacturers can build to so that they can provide a, a, a validated weather under this new silver category? And that's where we're going. We'd started out calling it the VFR weather network, but really it's the silver standard. And that's what we're building right now. Uh, it is right now we've got one installed in Palmer. One, it, we're, we're planning to install four systems. One is actively providing data in Palmer. The other three, Eek, Tetitlik, and Healy River, are in the processes of being installed. So the engineering is done. We're working the real estate and the environmental aspects of those, of those three locations. And as soon as those are complete, we will start construction on the, of those sites on those airports. Those, uh, all of those airports, let's just say Eek, Tetitlik, and Healy River, have, um, uh, they have uh, uh, approach, approach, let's see, uh, IFR approaches that are published for those airports, but no weather. There's no weather for the pilots to be able to use those approaches. So we're going to install systems there that are validated, visual weather observation systems, and we'll provide uh, at least confident weather data on those locations so pilots can now operate under the new 322 and 516 uh, legislation. I think with that, I've done a real good job of muddling right through all of this, but with that, I think I'm going to hand it off to Gordy to provide more of the flight standards perspective and, and the reason that this is uh, important. And, and maybe we can talk also about what the future implications of this are. So with that, Gordy, are you ready to jump in? Am I still on? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah still hear you. Still hear you. Okay. Okay. Well, 
I don't know if uh, if Gordy's still on or what's going on, but uh, uh, I will. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to speak for Gordy. This thing's so good, we ought to do it everywhere. So there you go. <laughs> Gordy's not here. So, so what Flight Standards is looking at is how do we how do we make sure that pilots have good, accurate, and solid weather information and 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 information that we can trust information that we can actually make approaches with how are we going to do that so what we've done is we've pulled together a a, a team of, of analysts uh, from the AFS 900 group and then my team I've hired a, an analyst to put together a bunch of test criteria so that we can run over the next year a test and analysis of this system and in the end take it back to our legal department for approval to use as one of the primary systems under this new silver standard that we're trying to that we are working to establish what are the future implications of this system it's a low cost observation platform that can be installed and operated it it's it it is it, it provides an automated self validation self check self reporting process where the system sits out there and operates when it has a problem it's it shuts down its data outputs and it sends a flag to the operator operators console that says i have a problem come fix me that way we're not putting anything out that might be a danger or or a or an a, a corruption of the of the data sets that we're providing to these pilots and what what can what will that do we can turn that specification over to the industry uh, at large and the industry if they follow that specification now can install their own and what i liken this to you is is it, it it's a it's a concept of process and and we can take a look at a at a great analogy back in the old days i'm going to call it uh, Ma Bell pretty much run the telecommunications systems out there and and a remote telephone was a phone booth out on the corner you plug your dime well it was a nickel then a dime then a quarter but you plug your money into that phone and you get to talk for if you can find a phone booth you get to call somebody uh, once Ma Bell was deregulated the industry at large picked up telephones and started playing with them and reduced telephones down to this device we carry in our pocket yeah, I can tell you right now if we can build a specification for a weather station that operators can install uh, uh, cost effectively and 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 a system that we as the agency can feel comfortable that there's a surety level on that or a confidence level that we can accept then what will happen is these things will proliferate out across the country and the FAA right now is really strapped for money. Uh, weather stations, especially the certified systems, the AWASs, are very expensive and they're very labor intensive. The new systems, if we do this right and if we can build a specification that allows the system to be installed where it self-checks, self-validates and reports problems and we have that confidence factor, these things will proliferate and they'll also shrink. They're gonna shrink both in size and in cost. So well, who's that going to serve? Well, that's going to serve everybody, not just piloted aircraft, but unpiloted aircraft. This this kind of an operation will open the doors to people being able to install systems affordably to serve their own needs if need be. So that's that's our goal. I know that's huge and that's big. That'll probably happen after, you know, after I'm I'm retired and and happily fishing somewhere. But, uh, but that's where we're headed. That's what we want to do, and that's what this VWAS does, is it kicks off the process of um, deregulating, if you will, the weather industry. One last thing I want to hit on here is the pirate refinement project that we've got working. We have an infrastructure laid in right now that, that makes it very feasible and efficient for us to help address PIREPS on two levels, um, both, both uh, availability as well as reliability. So we have a, a beta system that we're, we've built right now. We're, we're in the process 
of finalizing our connection into Wimsker on the test side of Wimsker so that we can do what I'm, I'm calling a round robin. A pilot or a dispatcher will be able to submit a PIREP through a self-checking application. So it goes through a program that ensures that they do not install or, excuse me, submit a, an, a corrupt or, or a, an incorrect PIREP. It goes through that, that, that self-check process. It goes into Wimsker and then out to the website as well as out to anybody else uh, through the national distribution process or national distribution network. So I'll be able to submit a PIREP. It'll go through the system and come back out on my website as well as anybody else that has their own website or is, is downloading AWAS is through Wimsker, uh, Wimsker ADDS, uh, or any other of the national distribution points. So uh, what's what we're doing now is with this process is we're going to open it up so that pilots can easily through our network and through our cloud uh, and into the national distribution submit PIREPs uh, so that dispatchers will be able to submit PIREPs and National Weather Service and Flight Service will be able to request PIREPs by by actually being able to overlay a a, 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 an, uh, a request over the uh, over the, uh, the the map itself. So when pilots are looking at our website and seeing the map, there will be a polygon drawn out in an area where you know those dark holes where we don't have any other weather information, but National Weather Service needs that for for the development of forecasts. So that's what we're doing with PIREPS. Uh, I talked about that last year and uh, we're a lot further ahead now than we were last year. I was really hoping that uh, by this time I could provide you with a, with a huge success story, but we are uh, working our way through this development of our connection into Wimsker and we're really close now. So with that, um, I wanted to go back. Gordy, are you online yet? Uh, Gordy's been Gordy's sending messages out that he um, has problems with the computer, but he said that uh, you hit it on all points. Okay, great. So I'd like to make a bunch of commitments for Gordy now that he can't respond. And, uh, you know, friends do that for each other. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'll hold back. I'll 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 end there, and I'll I'll open it to questions or back to you, Tom. Well, thanks very thanks much, Walter. Very, Walt. Walt. very, <laughs> exciting, very exciting stuff. stuff. Dave, do you want to go through some of the questions and comments that were being uh, offered? Sure. And um, I believe somebody has her. Well, no, the echo's gone away now. So somebody had it off mute. Um, yeah, there were several comments uh, which, which you kind of uh, touched on there about the miniaturization of, uh, of the system. Um, and Marilyn Pearson, um, not surprisingly, the UAS world would uh, benefit greatly uh, if this could be uh, miniaturized and validated. Uh, you know, several people chimed in on the uh, UAS aspect of it, uh, including some guy named Franzak. Um, so, um, let me see, there was something that was not UAS specific here. Uh, oh yes, uh, Frankie Pratt. Uh, has there been any discussion about adding cameras in Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands? For Walter there. Okay, so will you repeat that? Is, is, is the question, is there a plan for cameras there? Yeah, well, has there been any discussion, yeah, about adding cameras? in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands? Well, I have not been approached uh, for cameras in those locations. I'm more than happy to address that if you want to send me an email. What we would look for is, is of course, justification. It's going to cost money and time to do it, but I don't think that's a showstopper by any means. We just need to know that there is a need there. So if, if, uh, if they can send me a request for maybe for a briefing and a discussion on on how we move forward with with approaching that uh, that kind of a project. I'm happy to take it up and run with it. Alrighty, and I'm scanning through the rest of these, and it looks like uh, 
they were all talking about the uh, UAS aspect. Uh, here's one additional one from Marilyn Pearson uh, from over in AFS. Uh, maybe the U.S. operators could also submit PI reps or, or would they be U reps? So as mm -hmm. another comment and otherwise, I think that's uh, that's it, Walter. OK, OK, well, thank you for that. I will um, I'll hand it back to you guys now. And and Dave, actually, this is Matt. And uh, and early on, while Walter was on, uh, Matt Wandishin from uh, Noah Ezreal commented that the FAA's uh, QA PDT, what's that? Quality Assurance Product Development Team. I'm I'm not sure I know that acronym. Is evaluating the VIA output, and the results will be presented in February this coming February, 2021. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I saw that earlier and, and then I got enthralled with all the UAS comments. So <laughs> th yeah. thanks for well, circling me back to uh, uh, Matt's uh, comment there. Yeah, and I can tell you that, uh, that that test and analysis that's going on right now is exciting. We have, it, it gets more accurate every day, but we're quite pleased with it. And I see two two areas of huge benefit to to aviation and one is the remote monitoring aspect uh, that will help us validate the information that we're putting out from the cameras themselves as well as uh, a, a, another value that we can add to visibility and ceiling that might that, that will help give us some balance as to those outputs so in a METAR we can use that as a as a kind of a balancing factor against the actual outputs. So we're pretty happy about it. And I think I think it's going to there's a lot more applications we're going to see as this thing starts to develop and, and mature. And I am acronym challenged here. I kind of had made exactly the same assumption about quality assurance product development team. If that's what that is, it would make sense. But what is VEIA? Um, VEIA via visibility estimation through image analysis is what that ah. means. And uh, it's an algorithm that that learns from an image different edges in the image itself. And over time, it 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 learns those not just the edges itself of different structures and and different uh, uh, aspects of the image, but it also learns distances. And over time, it builds it. And this is a real simple way to ex to explain it. But over time, it perfects its ability to say how far you can see. So that's what that is. Is it's ed we lovingly call it edge detection. Well, maybe that'd be something uh, interesting to see if it's going to be presented in February at the maybe a snippet of that at the next FPA. Not to jump ahead to the planning meeting, but yeah, anyway, Jenny, it looks like that that Jenny, is Jenny Colavito. Oh, I'm sorry. Jenny Colavito is the program manager, and of course, Bill Bauman and and Randy know her well. She works for them, and uh, she would be perfect to have brief that in in the spring. So I'm not volunteering her. I'm just suggesting that. That was some of the other comments that came through about the fact that everybody works for Bill Bauman. Uh, um, all right, that looks like that's it. So um, Matt. And uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Walter. As as always, just a uh, um, just a very interesting presentation. And and you you are an Aces presenter, so I I love when I see your name on the agenda. And somehow, Tom Ryan, I don't know how you and Rocky worked this out, but somehow, despite the fact that I thought we were going to be at least thirty minutes early today, we're going to be if we press here on time. So wow, you guys, you guys clearly were 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 collaborating behind the scenes here on how this timing was going to work, unbeknownst to me or I suggest to Matthias. So so very nicely done, guys. Thank you. Mic drop. Say that one more time, Tom. I missed it. Sorry, I just said mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> All right. Um, Matthias, I have uh, nothing to add other than uh, my head is full and um, and and um, I think we've got some some material already uh, teed up for tomorrow. So um, uh, over to you to close us out before I go to my next meeting. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, no, I don't have anything to add either. This was a full four, four plus hours of stimulating discussions, uh, moving the needle a little bit and yeah, look ahead for tomorrow one way or another. And so I would like to thank everybody for their excellent presentations and uh, contributions to the discussions. And we'll see you tomorrow morning again at 11 o'clock Eastern time. So thank you all. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.